and and then uh, on page eight in report back from the public hearing, uh, I, the last paragraph should read, Commissioner Alex Jarrett explained that the money would have, that would have been taken from the fiscal stability stabilization fund to fund the police budget was not taken because of the cut and that the city took $300,000 from that fund recently to make up for the lost parking revenue. Um, Noah, if it's helpful, I can just uh, uh, message you that so you have the exact wording. Yeah, if you could actually email it to me, that would be beautiful because I can't um, copy and paste in the chat. Okay. Will Thank do. you so much for that clarification. Yep. I appreciate it. Okay, so um, we've tabled one and we have some changes to the second. Um, are there any other changes to the minutes? All right. Um, well, we can just approve those at the next once we see all of the changes um, that are made. Uh, just to make sure. So the next part of this is uh, opening up the floor to public comment. Um, we do for a maximum of 30 minutes. Um, during public comment, you'll be able to um, say anything that you like for three minutes. Um, we will be timing um, the comments. After three minutes, I will ask you to finish your sentence if you haven't finished um, during that time. If you do have additional comments, you can always follow up in, um, through email with us. So if you'd like to make a comment, you can raise your hand in Zoom um, by going to the participants icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen and then selecting raise hand. Um, I will be calling on people in the order that they raise their hand. Um, and you'll have three minutes once you start talking. Uh, so give me one second here to bring up the timer. All right. And so the first is Four as a phone number four one three five eight two seven zero eight one. Uh, yes, uh, are, do you hear me? Yep, we can hear okay. you. My name is Hildegard Friedman, living at 35 Fruit Street in K Hill Apartments, Government Housing in Northampton. I'm telling you this by virtue of the fact that I do not feel that this is how it should be handled. Uh, I reported and had three case numbers to the DA's office in the year 2018. I was reporting some mild violence. This was not O.J. Simpson, of course, but some mild violence that had been described to me by the victim, who was really a San Franciscan in Building B, Apartment 31, perpetrated by Alan Tauchnik, T-A-U-T-Z-N-I-K. Uh, I get along fine with him now, but my three case numbers I thought would contribute to some other work that would be done. He had been in jail about 12 times already. The police didn't do anything until someone heard a scream in that room, and then they went in and took pictures and put him in jail. Uh, the raison d'etre for this is there are other ways to handle that, okay? And the person is uh, at times even in my company and getting along with me at this point, but he has not solved his problems. So I hope you are not going to put him in jail again. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, the next person is Richard Hendrick. Um, so Richard, you're, uh, you're not unmuted yet. Thank you. There we go. Good evening. 
regarding the question of your last at your last meeting of any police presence within your deliberations um, this for me became an exercise in my new appreciation for non-binary thinking i am very much a novice at age 77 at looking of looking at the world within this lens i resist often kicking the beginning of my understanding of non-binary did bring me back to the universality of the wisdom of the mean between the extremes of the center and of the song that is frequently sung to our grandchildren you can't always get what you want i would sing that for you but i'll i'll leave that alone there is no middle ground no binary non-binary around george floyd breonna taylor Rashad Brooks, Stephen Clark, Walter Wallace Jr. But within the struggling, the wrestling for change, I have a better chance of coming to some resolution if I move out of my binary place, move out of that either or. Yes, that's easy for me to say, a white person in a white supremacist culture. I think you wisely instinctively fell into my biased new non-binary place by agreeing not to compel a vote, to let the matter unfold within the respective subcommittees. The heartfelt discernment and clear articulation was appreciated. It doesn't feel comfortable for me moving to the non-binary, but it's not about comfort. I wish if I could have seen the conjunction of the stars last night or tonight, but it didn't happen for me, but it did happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so the next uh, person is Marion Van Arlston. Okay, so I am speaking obviously from my position of white privilege and also from my position of white hair, which is another kind of privilege in one sense. In a community this size, I've had an opportunity to live here for 40 years and have had a variety of experiences, um, many of which have been very positive with the Northampton Police Department. But that obviously is a reflection of my white privilege. My concern at the last hearing was the absence of voices speaking to that, but also speaking from concern that we take seriously how we make this community safer for everyone, that everyone should feel as comfortable as I do to participate in activities in Northampton. My partner, Michael, and I had the experience of going to the rally, and I don't remember the exact date, but it was really the one where the Trump supporters had announced they would be in Northampton, and many groups were recruiting those of us from a different position to come downtown and stand in opposition to that. And when we drove downtown and saw the number of people that were there. And Michael and I have been to many rallies over our years in Northampton. He said for the first time, he actually felt rather afraid of entering into this. Because we are both in the at-risk group for COVID, we had not, we had decided we would not participate, although we completely supported the Black Lives Matter marches, but we stayed away. So this was our first time. As it became a louder and a more antagonistic demonstration, we happened to have positioned ourselves on that median strip across from CBS, thinking that was a good place to have some social distance, but be opposing Trump troops that were mostly on the other sidewalk in front of CBS. Looking down the street, I could see that the Northampton police had come out, not very conspicuously, but were standing one group by Florence Savings and one group over by Silverscape. 
And that was actually reassuring to me to see that they were there. At one point in the time where there were people near us who were also um, opposing the Trump troops, but with more chanting than we were. We were choosing not to, partly because of chanting and COVID not being a good combination in our minds. At one point, I went over to one of the younger women who had a bullhorn and who was leading a chant about um, defund the police or abolish the police. Am I out of time? That's your three minutes. Um, okay. but um, if you'd like to, you can always reach out through email to finish that. I, I will do that. I will do that. But I just want to finish my sentence with respect that one, what I said to her was, does that reassure you at all to see them there? And she said, no, you can't be with us if that's reassuring. And I said, I beg to differ. And I think we can be in common bounds about wanting to change and revision but still be appreciative of what the police have done for us and right. can do. All right. Thank, Thank you. you so uh, are there any other public comments? I'm gonna give it a minute. Okay. So I don't see any public comments. Um, so at this point, um, I'll move over to uh, the, the next agenda item, which is uh, the discussion of the chairing system and the election of uh, chair or chairs. Um, so I think as most of you know, at this point, um, Dana um, Olivo has resigned uh, from the commission and as she was a co-chair, that also leaves us short a co-chair as well. Um, so at this point, and since it's a pretty large uh, thing, I wanted to bring it up to see if anyone, to first get us all on the same page, are we still okay with the way that the chairing has happened so far? Are there changes structurally that we want to make? And then also ask if anyone wants to be a part of that as a chair as well. So two, two very separate questions, but I'll leave that up to hear from anybody. Javier, and then Alex. Uh, so I have a question for you then. Mm -hmm. um, it, because I just want to clarify something. Um, you accepted to be co. You didn't accept it to be chair. You accepted to be co-chair. It's and it's 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 it has that position changed in any way? That's the first question. And if and and basically that question and that answer, um, we would be compel or not to have to actually uh, have somebody to be your co-chair? I mean, okay, so I'll, <clears throat> I'll answer that as a, my position hasn't changed in that I do not want to be a sole chair. Um, I guess if there's a vice chair, I'd be okay with that, or I could be a vice chair to somebody. Um, personally, I prefer co-chair, just um, but I'm fine with whatever structure. Um, but I, I definitely do not want to be a sole chair with no vice chair either. Like, I think, A, there's way too much to do. Um, but also I do want like, a, I want some balance, um, and someone to be able to bounce ideas off of as well too. Um, and Alex. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I've been very, very happy with with you, Dan, and with Dana as co-chairs, and with your with the the structure. I will note the structure is is in our um, the document that constituted us. It says the commission shall elect its own co-chairs who shall be non non. 
they'll be resident non-elected members. So the city councilors can't be any either of the co-chairs. Um, so, um, and uh, the other question was, uh, if you could speak to whether we'll be filling, requesting to fill Dana's position or the other, I think there's one other position that hasn't been filled. Yeah. Um, so um, we didn't, or we decided not to fill um, Carmen's position um, when she resigned. We thought it would be too much to try and bring someone in this at this point or at that point. Um, Dana's um, Dana's position is open. We could ask um, the council president and the the mayor to us uh, to. Um, to assign someone if we wanted to. Um, again, this was a discussion that Dana and I had um, about Carmen, and now <laughs> there's no cha there's no co-chair to bounce ideas off of or concerns um, about a second person being missing. Um, so that's something that we can take up. We can take it up as a commission um, or just have the chairs make a decision um, as well. I mean. At this point, I wonder about the complexity of bringing someone on and introducing them to as much content as we've had already, but I'm also not against that either. It's not an impossible task. Um, Elizabeth? Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, I just wanted to to comment on. First of all, I think you're doing a fantastic job. I feel like that's you've just it's it's a, a hard job, and I and I really appreciate your leadership of it, um, and also of, of Dana's as well. So I'm really sad to see that she, that she's not with us anymore. Um, and I, I along those lines, I actually did want to bring up the fact that um, you know I'm the only woman of color left on this commission, and it continues to kind of along with the, you know there's no um, young mothers on this commission there's no I mean there's a lot of the demographic shape of this commission when we first started is no longer the same and um, if it kind of continues going in that direction it's, it's just not good so even as it stands I, I feel like it's um, I feel like it's becoming and an, it's going to become an issue in terms of the uh, just the validity of our of our recommendations and I, and I think it also speaks to some of the practices that we've been um, instituting thus far, you know, whereas, you know, whether it's uh, the length of these meetings, um, it's the timing, um, some of the, you know, I think there's something to be taught to, to, to speak to um, how, how we are losing some of the voices that we said were so important that we needed to hear from. Um, along those same lines, even this, um, even the way we are in these, especially these large meetings, uh, I know that there's a, you know, people raise their hands, they're kind of put on a queue, um, but I know we did this early on, but we haven't returned back to it, which is the, you know, if, if there's a certain voice is taking up a lot of room, you know, are we asking people to, you know, kind of step back? Are we, you know, bring, making sure all the, all the voices are counted in, in these meetings? Um, just some, a couple of pieces where I, I'm, I'm raising a concern and that it's not just about, getting you a co-chair, which I, I appreciate that that, that that would probably be um, a good idea to just because of the workload, but it's more than that role. It's it's really actually fundamental to the makeup of this commission and how we move forward. So I guess that um, that opens up a broader one, we can we can talk about this as a group. I think that's probably a good idea. But um, do we want to ask the mayor and the council president to replace um, replace Dana? And I, I say this. Um, I mean, we can ask them to find a person of color, give them requirements. You know, saying that we've lost all of these women of color. <laughs> We'd like to get some of that balance back. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, the original composition and the proposal of this commission was supposed to be of a particular, um, a particular ratio of people of color, um, which we've lost, um, we've lost what we originally had. Um, so I think that's a fine one. And I would put a lot of weight on um, the subcommittees that Dana was a part of as well um, to hear from them. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lois? 
Uh, I agree that uh, it's made a difference uh, uh, because the women that have left are women of color and also they're young. And um, so that's two parts of the balance that has been thrown off balance. And originally when we talked about uh, replacing the first person that left, um, I mean, suddenly there was a person who was in that, became in that place. And now there are these two empty positions. And originally I had thought that just like what you're saying, Dan, that maybe there's like too much packed up or something. But now I think, I, I don't think that. I think that uh, whoever these people are that you can, you know, are willing to do this and now have a better understanding of what kind of time commitment it is, um, that um, maybe they can be briefed by you and, um, I don't know, maybe Dana, even though she's no longer on the commission, uh, just to uh, brief whoever those people are and to uh, get them sort of in sync with what's been going on. So I uh, would hope that uh, that there is are two replacements and that they are, if possible, younger people and that they are people of color. So that's my, I hope that that can happen. I mean, I have no idea who all applied in the first place and how anybody was selected or any of that, but maybe it means actually going through, actually volunteered in the first place. Um, so I'm just looking at the raised hands. So David and then Cynthia. Yeah, um, I don't see any downside to asking the to Gina Louise and uh, the mayor um, to replace someone. I, I agree with everything that Elizabeth and, and Lois said. It, I think it's going to be uh, somebody's going to have to be a quick study. Uh, on the other hand, there are many people some of them women, I believe, who've been involved in the speak outs here, the public comment, they may well be people that could be considered for that role. Um, but I, I don't see any downside into asking uh, the city council president and the mayor um, to, uh, to replace the people that, that we've, we've lost. Um, once we have people who are willing to take that on, we can figure out how to get them up to speed. Um, and the other thing I would say is that it, whoever we take on is obviously not gonna be in position to jump in and be a co-chair. So I'm uh, hoping, uh, and I suspect many other people who haven't spoke are also hoping that one of the women on this commission remaining would volunteer to be co-chair with Dan. Thank you. Um, Nick, or sorry, uh, Cynthia and then Nick. Um, yeah, I, I think um, we should have another co-chair. Dan, you're doing a great job and I think the co-chair model works well. Um, I think it should be um, a person of color, preferably a woman of color. And I just need to ask and I don't need to have any details, but I wanna make sure that there isn't, or maybe there was something that this commission said or did or moved in a particular direction that allowed us to lose these two fine women. And so um, if there is, I think it's something either we should know about or the, any new candidate should know about. So I just wanna kind of get some relief on that, Dan. Can you just, I don't need particulars, but uh, um, can you just give us some general rationale for losing these women? Yeah, so um, the first, so um, Larissa um, cited childcare and work and time commitments um, outside of the commission and being too much um, to handle with adding the commission work in. Um, and you're gonna hear me say that same thing for the other three so that um, 
and I mean, this is this is sort of what we already know and would expect, right? So that women, especially women of color, are burdened with a lot of labor outside of just working hours and working in a pandemic is its own beast. Um, so, um, uh, so Carmen um, hadn't attended a couple of meetings and when I reached out to her, it was the same response of childcare work um, and the commission work being too much to fit in to that. Um, to that framework and the same with Dana. Thank you, Dan, that's helpful. Um, so, I mean, this also speaks to what Elizabeth was bringing up um, in terms of how we're structured. We can also re-examine re that, especially if people are having difficulty meeting, like making meetings or whatever it is that we can do to accommodate people working different schedules and with different workloads. Um, Nick and then Alex. Um, thank you, Dan, for filling us in. That That is actually very helpful and actually tells a little bit of a story on its own. Um, I, I'm agreeing with David and with the general sentiment that, uh, well, first of all, I think you need a co-chair. I, I mean, there's it, I, it, anybody in your position, uh, I think, would. Uh, I think that adding to the commission is definitely a possibility. I don't think it will be um, that difficult to um, get up to speed. It might take a little while. I also want to just mention that the there were six, I believe, around 65 applicants for the commission who people, uh, and, and it's how Carol was, was um, brought on to the commission um, a part, part of the way in. And I think that the people who originally applied for the commission um, uh, would, would probably be uh, 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 strong candidates. And they may be people who have been uh, on the uh, public comment as well. But I just wanted to remind people that there, there are a list of people who really wanted to be on the commission. I, I would welcome uh, a replacement. Alex? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I think Elizabeth brings up very good points as others have. And, and this br brings me back to something that we discussed during the formation of the commission, which was um, paying people uh, for their time or at least reimbursing them for, for expenses such as childcare and such. Something that the city did not feel ready to take on. Um, there just isn't the structure for that. Um, but it was suggested that there may be an organization that might give grants um, to, to assist people in that, in that way. Um, and um, whether that be a nonprofit or, or something that promotes leadership development. Um, and so that's, that's something we could uh, look into further uh, that might, might support people um, who are otherwise having difficulty um, doing the work, the very important work of, of the commission. Okay. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you know any like groups that are like standing out, like blazing in your mind um, that I could reach out to? You know, I know there there is one. I it might be Leadership Pioneer Valley, but I'm not actually sure. Um, and so, it would, uh, but I could ask. I could try. I will look back in my records because this was something that, that I've been researching for a while, um, but I can't remember offhand. Okay. I don't know if anyone else does. Uh, Lois. Uh, I don't know if they'd be the. I don't know if they'd be the appropriate one, but they're they're they fund things in uh, Western Mass, progressive work in Western Mass, and that's the Markham Mason Fund. Okay. And I I know they have uh, you know different round funding rounds, but I think they also had uh, some kind of open maybe application because of COVID. Not sure if that's true. Uh, Lois, can uh, you repeat the name of that group? 
Markham, M-A-R-K-H-A-M hyphen Nathan fund. It was started by Archie Markham, who's no longer with us, and Marty Nathan, who lives in Northampton. Uh, and they're small grants, but I don't think we're talking about that much money. And I, I don't know whether they'd be open to it or not, but uh, you can contact them and see. I don't know. I don't know if they've been following along. They probably have to some degree. Marty Nathan and probably Elliot Bracken, she's married to. They're both part of the Mark Nathan Fund. So just because they're here, and I'm assuming that they're concerned with what's going on here, I mean, in the commission, but also in the Northampton. Thank you. Um, and it's an easy application process. <laughs> That's another important element. All right, awesome. Uh, and then Elizabeth? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if um, if they would if they would fund this or not, but uh, maybe the Community Foundation, uh, Western Mass, may be able to. Um, I mean, maybe or they may at least be able to point in, in a direction that might be helpful. I know they're doing quite a bit of um, support work for for this particular moment that um, that we're in. But I think. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that the, that that would be really innovative and interesting to you know to to see if there's a some money to be able to do that to support uh, child care in particular. Um, I just I just don't also want it to be lost that there's there's a there's a multitude of reasons why it's so difficult for you know specifically you know women of color or people of color to serve on this committee. You know it is it's the timing of all of that, but it is you know exploring a lot of these issues. You know uh, it's also revisiting trauma with the police, you know, so I think that that's something that shouldn't be ignored as well It's just how difficult it is to be serving, um, you know, on this committee, you know, on this commission, um, and doing the deep dive investigations, all of this, it's just, it is, there's a lot that's actually required for, you know, um, you know, people of color to show up here. So, you know, just that not to uh, not to like let that, um, you know, just to hold that as well. Uh, Lois, did you have your hand up again? No, okay. Um, so at this point, um, I just wanna check in with folks. So I'm, I've been writing down um, things. So I'm gonna reach out to the um, to the groups that, that were at least listed and I'll try and do some research on my own to find some others um, that might be able to either provide um, support for childcare or um, funds and leadership training as well um, for folks. Uh, I know Leadership Pioneer Valley does a lot of certification for their leadership as well. So that'd be something nice to have as like a, you know, um, you know for a resume and things like that. Um, and hopefully that'll help. If folks have other ideas, please let me know. Um, or if you have other concerns or notice things, um, just so that we can jump on them and be as proactive as possible. Um, I'm also going to reach out to uh, the city council president and the mayor um, to ask that they do replace both Dana and Carmen um, with, um, and we that we have a preference for younger women of color and parents um, in terms of additional um, members. Does that sound okay to everybody? Okay. <laughs> So I'll take that as my action item. I don't think we need to vote on it, but I do want to check. Does anyone have anything that they don't or that they're concerned or that I'm missing? Okay, uh, so we'll chalk that one up. <laughs> um, that does still leave us with um, the need to elect. Who wants to say something? Oh, yep, yeah, Booger. Do you need somebody to um, sit in as a co-chair with you until we get that other person? Well, so that was going to that was going to be the the next part. Um, is that I don't know if it's appropriate to tell someone that they would be coming in as a co-chair and have that as a requirement for joining the commission, 
or if there are folks that would also like to be a co-chair who are already on the commission. Um, and like, I'll be honest with folks, it's a lot more time than I thought it would be. Um, and a lot more, a lot more emails and a lot more bureaucracy than I'd expected. And that's not that bad, but um, just to be realistic, because it is, um, and just keeping up emails, making sure that you know the policy, um, policies and the laws the city follow and also the state. Uh, you'll also be part supervisor of NOAA as well. <laughs> um, like, so like there, there is, there is, um, there's a lot to this. I don't want anyone to walk in blindly, but I'll also say it'd be great if someone wanted to volunteer. Um, the balance of that, um, we could put this off um, until we have another, or until we have the two commissioners and then offer them the position as well. I know one of the concerns is that um, you know, we don't have a woman, a, a woman or specifically a woman of color to take that position um, aside from Elizabeth and then it becomes sort of a, an imposition rather than a volunteering opportunity. <laughs> Um, and I don't want to put all of the pressure on Elizabeth. Although if you wanted, Elizabeth, if you wanted to, you're more than welcome to <laughs> um, take that chairship. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm, thank you. I'm, I've been really, uh, really, um, uh, I, I'd rather not. And I, and I, but I do appreciate um, all the great work you're doing. Um, and uh, uh, Yes, but it definitely is. It's definitely too much for me to, to take on. Thank you. All right. Um, so I will reach out to the council presidents, um, uh, the council president and the mayor, um, and see if they can replace um, two folks. And then um, we can revisit this um, January 5th, I think, is our next meeting. Yes, January 5th. All right. Um, <clears throat> are there any other comments about about that yet, or about that still? <clears throat> Not seeing anything. So um, the next part is the outwork, uh, the outreach working group update, um, which is, um, as Alex pointed out very rightly, uh, and we got confirmation from the solicitor that. Um, the outreach group would be a subcommittee um, based on the definition of subcommittees. Um, so that would be the formation of a new subcommittee that would be dedicated to outreach um, to marginalized um, populations and to folks who are not able to attend either the public hearings or the public meetings that we have or the subcommittee meetings, um, either from a lack of resources, a lack of time, other restrictions that they're facing, um, or just a concern about their own safety, um, fear of retribution, um, fear of outing themselves or being in public, whatever it is. Um, and there's a lot of work that goes into that. Um, the other, um, and so a lot of that would be building relationships um, with groups that are already working with those communities, um, just because you can't just run around the city screaming, hey, who wants to talk? Um, and these groups would help. Um, there are two options. One is that we form a subcommittee and people take time to dedicate to do that um, and do that work. The other option is um, that we don't have a subcommittee and that there are individual tasks that people go out to perform. They do not work with anybody else. They do not communicate with anybody else outside of the general meeting uh, around that task. Um, so it can be individuals and you can be together in site visits if you were doing them. So if you were visiting a shelter or um, you know, um, offices or anything like that, um, you could be together as long as you're not talking about the work, but you're physically in the same space at the same time, um, which is a much more hamstrung approach and doesn't really leave a lot of room for doing the sort of development of different tools and outreach um, approaches, um, aside from doing it sort of ad hoc and individually. Uh, Javier? Um, 
Thanks. <clears throat> Can you hear me well? Yep. I so um, I would advocate to the creation of a specific subcommittee, just because we need. Um, I don't know if uniformity is the right word, but I mean the the testimonies in any way that they are going to be done needs to be keep up keep the same uh, form. Uh, I feel that if we're doing each of us, like some of us going independently, there's going to be a sort of an imbalance and extremely different ways to gather that information. And I think that's a little pervasive to the process. Also, I think working as a subcommittee, we would be able to, uh, as you said, to work hand to hand with our, our organization naturally doing the work on the ground and, uh, Okay, so um, that would be the commit. Um, so you're talking about really doing a lot of the work. Um, I sort of find myself in the same vein. Um, does anyone else um, have any comments, questions, concerns, or um, potentially would you volunteer if there was a subcommittee that was formed as well? Cynthia? Um, just to clarify, uh, the outreach committee as a subcommittee, um, as I'm hearing the conversation and envisioning it, um, does this sound and look like something that individuals would be physically going into the community to conduct their work? Just a clarification of that. Then I just, if the answer is yes, I'm just, um, as a member of the Board of Health, reminding folks of COVID. So just some thoughts on that. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I think one of the ideas was that if we can build relationships uh, with groups that are already working with people in person, if we needed to deploy something that was in person, um, that we could do so without having people go into spaces if they didn't want to or weren't comfortable um, and to minimize risk. Um, we still have to consider, you know, we can't gather people um, you know, in large groups and it's also pretty cold outside. So doing things outside all the time might not be the perfect um, solution. And even then it's a small number. Um, so I would say the answer is probably potentially yes, likely yes at some point. Um, but I wouldn't say that it's a requirement that if you join that subcommittee, you would have to physically go out, if, um, especially if you weren't comfortable with it. Um, and that is something that the subcommittee would have to sort of decide and figure out um, together, um, as to what what outreach would be done or what's feasible and in what ways. Uh, Nick? Would the subcommittee um, be following the same public meeting rules that the other subcommittees are following? Yeah, so that was the, we were sort of hoping that if it was just a working group that was dedicated to not actually discussing the work of the commission, but just action that we could get around that. Um, but no, we would still be subjects. Um, there's no working group classification within open meeting law. It's either <laughs> you're a committee or you're not. So it would be subject to open meeting law. And and can I ask if um, if you or the other other commissioners have um, uh, particular groups in mind that that we would be contacting? Uh, specific specific groups. Um, I would say there are a few that we've reached out to or that have reached out to us um, right now. Looking at the library, the Forbes Library. Um, Looking at um, the Western Mass BI, uh, was it BIPOC Advisory Council, the Recovery Learning Center, um, the Northampton Recovery Center, um, but but these are uh, and also maybe working with a group that's um, that used to be Pioneer Valley Housing. It's now called a Touch um, so Touch the Sky, um, but that's not an exhaustive list um, because 
you know, at the moment, it's been a lot of focus on unhoused, housing insecure um, folks um, and people who are in recovery or being treated with mental illness or for mental illness. Um, but it's also been, but that's not the only group um, that we want to reach out to. Um, so there's still um, domestic abuse survivors, um, and, and there's just a long list of other people. Um, so there's probably a long list of other groups that we would want to reach out to as well. Thank you, that's helpful. So, uh, Booker? Um, sort of an idea that came from uh, Lois's comments in our meeting this morning uh, for the alternatives committee is I'd like to hear more voices from people who are living in public housing and their experiences with policing. And that's been a voice that hasn't been heard yet. Um, so that's something I would like. Um, the reason I took my hand down though is I wanted to volunteer to Carol to talk about this a little bit. Um, because she actually has a lot of experience with doing this kind of qualitative work, and if she's willing to or feeling up to it. Sure. So uh, my idea is uh, to work with um, what's known as a convenience sample. It means that uh, we're not looking for pros and cons. We're not looking for a balance of pro and con uh, experiences of policing. We're going to organizations that are essentially advocacy organizations. I think of, for example, the Pioneer Valley Workers Center that I would add to that list too. Um, there are people. There are many workers. Uh, involved with the, the Worker Center, including a lot of our food service people in this town. And so I think that would be, you know, instead of my going out as a white identified upper middle class person on this commission saying, who can I find who is, um, you know, immigrant labor, who is a member of this community, um, I would go through, for example, the worker center and say, do you, can you identify for me? That's the convenience sample. Can you identify for me three people who might be interested in talking, who have an experience in this town, who've been here for a while, who um, would, would, would be willing to talk with members of this commission because we're accessing, um, we're not doing survey, we're doing interview. And we really are, want to um, talk to folks, maybe in a group of three, not, not necessarily individually. It depends on you know, what the needs of the person, the, the informant is. Um, because sometimes what I've found in my research, when I interview, it would say essentially like a focus group of three or four people, what happens is they build the phenomenon that I'm wanting to look at. So it's not in, so what gets captured is not just an individual's experience or an, one incident with, with the police that they thought was very helpful or very not helpful or very abusive. But you know, people play off of one another in that interview or focus group process. And what you come away with as the researcher, the community researcher is a really sense of the phenomenon that you're looking for. So that's, I think I had advocated that earlier that we go through the or the the, the well-known organizations that are advocacy uh, groups for these uh, uh, members of the, the, the demographics that we want to reach. And Javier? Yeah, but taken from um, what Carol just said, uh, you know, my, my professional capacity, I work every day with undocumented folks in, our, in, the, in all Western Mass. I mean that's I don't I don't think we're gonna have any issue being able to uh, getting contacting and working with with people that are their voices are are not here because they don't have the privilege to be here. Um, for me, it's, again, I I, I want to just go back because at the end of the day, um, 
if we, the decision is if we're going to have a subcommittee or no. That's the committee is going to have to meet it. That's the committee is going to have to decide how they are going to proceed. And I feel that's that's sort of more more relevant to now when we have to decide. Right. And so part of this the subcommittee would be deciding how like how these outreach how outreach is going to occur. Um, you know, is it focus groups? Is it how is that going to be done, you know, in a COVID safe manner? Is it going to be surveys? If it's surveys, what are the questions? What's the data collection? Um, that group could also or should also be looking at anonymity um, in terms of the people who are speaking. Um, you know, we can decide as a group what the what uh, would make some what would you know warrant the threshold of making someone's comment anonymous if they ask for it. Um, is it just that they ask for it? Is it that we make all comments anonymous? Um, how, what what level of anonymity is there? If we're recording comments that are going to be played back, do we also need to have video and vocal processing to make somebody anonymous, or is just not using their name enough? Is you know so like what de-identification we might go through as well? Um, the, the sampling. You know, so talking about individuals, focus groups, are we going to be snowballing? Are we going to be sending out digital spaces? Or are we going to create digital spaces or physical ones? We're going to have like a physical flyer that we can put out. <laughs> All of those different methods for sort of building up that sample are going to be important. Um, I would definitely say it's worth a pretty prolonged conversation. Um, I would be open to being on that commission myself. Um, but it would also need folks to volunteer because it can't just be one or two people. <laughs> um, Javier? Uh, I would also volunteer to be there. And Carol as well? Okay. Yes, I would be happy to be on that. All right. All right. Um, so I think we've got at least the threshold to start. <laughs> um, and so I would feel comfortable making a motion that we create a new subcommittee tasked with um, outreach and collecting public comment, um, especially from the voices who are not able to be heard during our meetings from mar marginalized or most impacted communities. Um, all right, and Booker just gave the second. <laughs> Noah, can you do a quick um, call? Um, Dan? Yes. Booker? Yes. Carol? Yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, Cynthia? Uh, yes. Josie? Here, yes. <laughs> Namdi? Yes. Um, Alex? Yes. And David? I think you're saying yes, but you're muted, but I see you speaking. Sorry, yes. <laughs> That's okay, no worries. Um, I went out of order too, I'm trying to think. Um, Elizabeth? Yes. Yes, Lois? Yes. Yeah. And did I forget someone? Nick. Yes. And Javier. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So that passes. Um, so we'll structure that. Um, oh, Alex. Did I forget I you? Just to, oh, <clears throat> I just wanted to say that uh, although I don't have the time to serve on that committee. Uh, if there are individual outreach tasks, uh, I would be interested in, in doing one of those just on my own. Okay, excellent. Um, so um, the first subcommittee um, will need to, <laughs> uh, for the first subcommittee, we'll have an organizational meeting um, where we'll need to sort of determine the structure um, and all of those things. So I will send out a, a really quick poll to just figure out when we'll meet um, just for that um, organizational meeting. Um, 
if other folks are interested in being on that, um, it would be great to hear from you pretty soon, um, just so we can get things scheduled, um, especially with the days that the city is closed, the deadlines for meetings happening soon are pretty limited. Um, all right, on that, um, are there any other comments on that um, that we wanna add before moving on? All right, so um, we'll move to the updates from the subcommittees and I will or we'll start with the alternatives to policing. So I don't know, um, Booker or um, Javier. Uh, we didn't decide who was going to give the update. I'd like to nominate Javier. I would like to second Booker. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I but I think it would be more Solomonical to have Alex. So let me start off by saying. Um, Thanks to Carol and Alex, who gave us incredible starts with constructing a document for um, your perusal. I guess I want to ask Noah um, if it's possible for us to share those documents with the people who are here. Um, then I'm going to I'm going to turn to Alex and sort of talk about how because Alex has been um, a really good guidance in terms of how to try to craft this stuff in committee um, and where to go from here. So I'm gonna ask Noah if it's possible to share the document that exists with you. And, I, and Alex, would you mind talking a little bit about what kind of guidance we would like from people from this evening with the document that we have so far? Sure. Yeah, so I just enabled screen share. So if anyone has the document up, they can, and whoever's speaking, it might be easier if you controlled it. But if you don't want to, um, Noah should be able to. Do you have a preference? Uh, I would prefer it if Noah could bring it up, but, yeah. but if I can get there first, I might. I know, let's race, let's see. Mm. While that's getting ready to come up, um, I think at, it was actually sent around to everybody prior to um, this meeting in case people wanted to read it beforehand. It is a longish document. Um, it it's, has a statement of purposes and then it goes into more detail around three or four specific issues around alternatives to policing. Um, we were joined in our crafting conversation by Lois and also some members of the community who pointed out to us things that we had left out and we ought to consider for more um, perusal. I think, um, well, I'd like to hear comments from other people, but me, you may need to look at it and read it a bit. Are you able to share it, Noah? Or? Yes, I have it here. And then I will share my screen. One second, let's make sure. Okay. And I'm going to mute now. And Alex, if you don't mind leading the discussion from here, is that all right? Yes, that's fine. Um, yeah. So one of the challenges with this is is trying to craft something collectively. Uh, when we can't work outside of meetings. Um, so we'll, what we did uh, was we first, we each were assigned particular pieces of the work, uh, came up with our draft. And then when we got together in the meeting, we temporarily created a shared document in which we dumped all of our work together and then were able to uh, comment and edit live only during the meeting. Then when the meeting ended, we um, made it so that that could not no longer be 
um, shared or edited or commented. Uh, and also we had the members of the public who were attending had permission to comment. Um, so they, they added, uh, I think, some important comments, which we haven't had the chance yet to incorporate. Um, and so our, our process going forward is um, that we want feedback from this commission um, and our next, we'll, we'll take that, that feedback and each of us will redraft and re-edit our particular sections. And then our, at our subcommittee on January 4th, we will, we will finalize and edit together. Uh, and then we will submit that to all of you for finalization um, or approval on at our January 5th meeting. Um, so that was our process to try to, to you know, be able to get feedback from each other and from the commission um, and then also uh, be able to rework that and then hopefully have something that's acceptable to the commission uh, for January 5th. Uh, so um, there's um, an overview which Javier wrote um, and uh, then we go through a few different uh, sections, uh, specific types of work. Um, and in every section here, we have a further work uh, piece, which is stating, um, and we, there's probably a lot more to add to that further work, um, but is to state the, the areas that we feel we have not yet uh, done enough work in, which I think are, are numerous. Um, so I wrote the domestic violence section and um, then also some suggested changes for the overview, which Javier may work in. And um, then at the bottom of this domestic violence section, there's a, there's a further work section um, that uh, to, to really get us get to understand that this is a preliminary report, not and to some extent, I think a progress report um, and that, that, that I don't feel ready to make a very strong recommendations at this point, given that there's a lot more people to talk to. Um, <clears throat> But um, it's a good it's a good start, and I also tried to include as many references and resources uh, as I could for the statements that we made, um, and uh, so I hope that those those are helpful. Um, and then Booker wrote about uh, homelessness, houselessness, uh, and um, uh, Carol. Oh no, Booker also is writing about substance use. Uh, and then Carol is writing about mental health um, responses. Uh, so um, those are our, our charges. And um, I know it's a, it's a sort of a, it's a lot to take in and not a lot of time to give feedback because, you know, once this meeting ends, you're not really able to give feedback to us. Um, so that, that's sort of frustrating. Uh, <clears throat> But uh, that's that's where we're at. So I um, can't really raise my hand, but I just wanted to offer one comment that I think is going to be a common thread throughout all of the work of the subcommittees and this commission in general. So this isn't specific to this because I look through it. And it's really like, I think that there's a lot of good stuff in here, but I think one of the things that we, we don't have, and Elizabeth, I'm going to bring this up because I know you brought it up a whole bunch. We still don't have a, what we're working towards. Like what is, what is our vision of, um, what is our vision of Northampton that we are moving to? Um, is it, you know, is it more abolition oriented? Is it reform? Are we looking at, you know, a 10 year program? Are we looking at something that has, you know, are we looking at setting up milestones to like all of those sort of um, sort of things? And we haven't really answered that question yet. Sort of the elephant in the room. <laughs> um, and I think it is going to be one of those things that is that conversation is probably going to have a whole bunch of pushback. Um, that you know from different folks um, for various reasons, and um, I mean, but I think it's maybe worth having. And I think, not to put you all on the spot, but the alternatives, you're sort of the champions in this position because 
you are the one saying this is our reimagining um, in that. And I'm sorry, I have a different view because we're sharing the screen. Um, but I think I saw Booker's hand. I'm sort of flowing through these. <laughs> So um, thanks, Dan, for pointing out that that's an important thing. Alex actually importantly drop has a paragraph within it that I'm going to be careful about how I say this, um, that I don't want to use the word incremental, but we, we actually see our process as something we move towards. I, I, this is my comment. I don't see it as necessarily abolitionist. I see it more as, I think we're, we have a, Alex, maybe you should find the comment and read it out loud. Um, and of course, this doesn't mean this is what the whole commission feels, but this is the way we're viewing it, that we're sort of seeing things changing in a gradual fashion rather than a, <clears throat> stop things and go on from there. Am I stating that fairly from the views of the rest of the alternatives committee? Um, yeah, I'm happy to read it if you want to, uh, Noah, if you could just scroll down to the beginning of my section, which is right below Javier's. Uh, there it is under overview, overview language to consider. So I wrote change in our public safety system will take time. We envision a phased process whereby we put increasing resources into programs that will research, design and implement proactive data driven practices that will reduce the scope of policing, focusing on supporting people rather than policing them. These programs need to center the people who are most impacted by the current policing system. Our city's charter gives the executive branch the final say in implementing city programs. We need to creatively design a department of community care that is accountable and transparent to the community and where the voice of the executive branch is one voice among many. And, um, so I'm looking, I don't see anyone else with a hand up. So I guess I'm gonna throw my, I'm gonna throw it in and respond and say, I, I like that. Um, but I guess what I'm thinking for the commission's final report, are we looking to describe a process by which another commission will make recommendations? Are we saying we have a vision of what the future will be and we are going to make these recommendations that need to be done in some way and here's a process for how to determine how those happen or here's metrics, here's milestones that need to be achieved by a certain point in order to reach those goals? Like those are the sort of like, that that question like how how forceful are we um and and really what are we looking to to do um so i, I know david's been using the, the phrase reducing the footprint of the police and i really like that i've started using it myself a lot <laughs> um but to really talk about is that where we're is that where we're heading and or are we saying we have a process or we want to identify a process for how the city does that and implements it, those sort of things like Alex? I can respond uh, just to clarify my thinking and writing that if you if that if you'd like to hear that. Um, yeah, so you know this this is an issue that, uh, academics, that activists, the public service, public servants have been have been wrestling with for a long time. To uh, you know, how do we how do we change our public safety system and reduce the scope of policing? And uh, although we're putting in you know a great amount of time and doing great research and have good knowledge, we're not going to come up with all the answers in the time that we have. And so, my thought is that that we. Um, <clears throat> Not that there's another commission exactly, but rather that there is a an actual city department with paid staff um, that has an advisory board as well uh, <clears throat> that is is mo that moves on this issue and and starts with the low hanging fruit and starts with the 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 things where we have the most evidence um, and then but also tries new things out. Um, and 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 gathers that evidence because in some cases we don't have we don't have all the data to say yes you sh we should just implement this uh, and and remove the, you know remove this um, so uh, I you know that's where I, I my thoughts about the, the phased process 
um, but how how much we dic how much we say okay it should be this we should you know take this much money and and fund this much and I don't know um, that that's still something that that I think uh, there's more research and, and learning to be done for me at least. Okay, um, so um, Carol, Javier, Elizabeth, uh, Michael, and then Cynthia. So I see everybody. If anybody else is in there, let me know. <laughs> Scroll okay. up. I think we've got everybody. Yeah. yeah. So one of my thoughts, uh, listening to you, Alex, is um, that I could pull up part of or integrate in um, part of an introductory piece that I had written that is not showing up in this document that really basically says, uh, and it's too long, I can make it shorter, but it, it basically talks about the disinvestment over a 30 year period in various human services and mental health services in communities. And that, that one of the things that we want to recommend is uh, built right away for the city to start rebuilding capacity in these areas. And so, so adding that to the context, um, you know, it's a general statement, but uh, then it can um, be followed up below with more specific recommendations, you know, building capacity. That, you know, that's going to be an incremental thing. It's not a revolution. It doesn't happen overnight because it took at least 30 years to of disinvestment to get us to the place where you know people are living on the streets and we have food insufficiency and we have people with mental health needs who are not being served. Um, so I mean that's just my suggestion. I could we could do that when we're when we're editing. Add that to the the overview. Great, thank you, um, Javier. Yep. Um, see, I was going to mention that Carol wrote something that is not here, right, Carol? I mean, the one that first we saw that it's an incredible document that would be good uh, for that one. Was that one chaired, Carol? Yeah? Okay. So, um, it's, so yeah, it was somewhere. Let's see. Noah probably has it. Do you, Noah, do you have something that I sent you either last night or today? So in the meantime, now I look for that. So uh, the question that you're posing, Dan, I think it's 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 in relationship that the fact that the commission we haven't decided how we're deciding. Mm -hmm. Are we are we deciding by a vote? Or are we deciding by 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 a balanced consensus, or you know, majority wins and where we're heading? And I think that's what's complicating at least, you know, we're the first subcommittee going to in reporting, but I think without having that direction, that direction with that decision from the entire group, it's hard to say. I mean, we had been talking in our subcommittee for weeks about the possible creation of a, of a department. And, but, but, you know, I don't think that has been talked about in the entire commission. So I, I'm not even sure if that's where we're moving. I know that that's where <laughs> our committee would like to move, but at this point, when we're talking about a cohesive, cohesive report, that the kind of question that you're posing is something that ch should be addressed by the entire commission to us where we're going. Actually, I don't think it's part of the subcommittees to decide that. I mean, the subcommittees can inform the decision but the committees are not making unilaterally their, that decision. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, so it's, um, did we lose people out of the order? So I have Elizabeth and then um, Cynthia and then Elizabeth. Was it me? Uh, no. Um, okay. So it's uh, Cynthia and then Elizabeth. I'm, I'm happy to go, Dan. I think there were a couple people ahead of me, but I'm happy to go, whatever you want to do. 
yeah, sorry, it's just people are out of order and some people took their hands down, so. Um, um, I'll just, is that all right if I go? Or, um, um, I just wanna thank the Alternatives Committee for this great document. Um, it's fantastic. And I also wanna jump on what Javier and Dan are saying. Um, I spent the week talking with city councilors, both current and former, because my biggest concern is that we have a lot of recommendations and we don't, um, except for Michael and Alex, perhaps understand the system that the city operates under through its bylaws with the executive branch and the city council, how to get this done. And so um, Alex mentioned the Department of Community Care. Um, I and my recommendations, our subcommittee um, said the Department of Safety. But um, in terms of moving forward, I think we need to, um, and this is a commission-wide decision, um, have a department that is in the executive branch. Unfortunately, that's the only place it can sit. Michael and Alex, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it can't be a, a commission for the, for the uh, city council. It has to be an actual department where some of the, the ideas that are mentioned in the alternatives uh, committee can be put, placed, um, that goes beyond partnerships, that goes beyond you know, handshake agreements, that it's an actual uh, department of safety or community care where all the things that we've identified that the police um, should not be involved in go into this department. And so I'm giving a sort of that broad, um, um, beginning with the end in mind, Dan, that you were sort of asking for. And, um, and uh, it's, it's mentioned in this report and I would love to see it highlighted because it allows the other committees to put their ideas into a place. And um, I, think it's, uh, I think it's gonna be part of our responsibility to recommend to the mayor and the city council um, how to enact our findings. Yes, they'll be incremental, incremental but um, I really strongly believe in, in a department that really isn't run by the police department at all. It's, it's run through the executive branch um, to make these things happen. So um, I commend you, you all for uh, getting us on this, on this path to think about this. All right, thank you. Um, so we have Elizabeth and then Michael and then Lois. Um, thank you. you know, this, this is a really, this is report is, uh, is, is definitely helpful. I think um, one of the things I wanted to flag was that, that I, I don't know if we're all going to, um, I don't know if we're all going to be able to agree on, on what these recommendations are. And so, I'm, I mean, I don't want to go into like how we process the process, but I just feel like that, you know, that I just want to put that out there because I feel like some of the comments um, have been uh, almost kind of assuming that we're all in the same page around certain things, like the incremental piece. I just heard a 30-year investment, which I am, which again, I absolutely would not support. So I mean, there's things like this that I, I don't know if we'll be able to agree on, but I just think that we it, it, we should um, we should pause if we feel like we do have agreement on some things, because I, I know that that's definitely not not the case. Um, and uh, you know, just just to, you know, in terms of the department piece as well, I feel like that does make some sense um, to, to think about a department, but I, I also think it's a little bit cart before the horse, you know, thinking of, again, I feel like with what this commission has been doing a lot of, you know, since we started doing this is either focusing a lot on process, focusing on creation of a, of a, of a department or a thing without talking about values. We, that still does not have the conversation we're almost assuming the values first that we're all on board with incrementalism and then saying, okay, now here's a department. And, and, and it's, I think we're avoiding that, the, the main thrust of the conversation. Um, and again, creating something, um, uh, again, cart before the horse in, in a lot of ways. And so I, I guess I just want to bring it back to, you know, can we have a conversation about what it is that we're, where our values are around, around these recommendations um, I think that will guide the process, and I think that will guide, you know, what the, you know, recommendations of an entity 
know, before we start creating bureaucracy, before we even have a guiding principle around what, what it is we're creating. I just don't know that that's the right way to go. I think that's, that's kind of where, that's kind of where I am as well. Um, uh, Michael and then Lois. Well, uh, first, I want to apologize to uh, to all of you for being late today. I just got hung up at work and couldn't get here, and I apologize for that. Uh, I did did come into the meeting at seven oh five, so I missed quite a bit, but I will uh, catch up by watching the recording later. Uh, and then, second, I wanted to thank this um, alternatives to policing subcommittee because this is uh, to just say what some other people have already said. This is a pretty terrific document. I didn't have a chance to read the whole thing uh, yet, but I but I will dive into it. Um, you know, and then and then I was thinking about, you know, this, you know, Cynthia, I think you're right uh, that, you know, the kind of the way this would work would fall into the executive branch. Um, I would I would note that, you know, in a number of cases like, um, you know, uh, the, you know, the, um, you know, there are offices, pardon me, that in the in the executive branch that do have, you um, you know, advisory committees, uh, you know, the, the Board of Health uh, kind of works, I think, in conjunction with the Health Department quite a bit. I think there are uh, other offices too. And, and I see a, 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 an Office of Community Care as kind of an interesting um, idea. And, and I see it, you know, I wonder if this couldn't be, you know, if this this commission that we're on now, not necessarily this, this exact iteration of it, but if there wouldn't be another opportunity to have a citizen committee a resident committee devoted to advising uh, that office, as well as you know maybe some interface with with the um, Human Rights Commission, uh, because I think that that kind of ties together pretty nicely as well. So I just wanted to say those couple of things uh, that I you know I, I do appreciate the idea and I, I think it's interesting, and you know uh, I've talked about this before. I certainly talked about it in June in the City Council, but you know when 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 Claire Higgins put together the sustainability study. Uh, you know, that is something that gets kind of revised every five years. And, and you know, this, the idea of even uh, being carbon neutral by a certain date was set out a long time ago. And, and of course, that needs to be updated as more information becomes available. So uh, we learned that maybe some things we're doing we shouldn't be doing and, and we should take on new tasks. And so I think there's opportunity for an advisory committee like, like the one that we're on now, but, but more specific to an office. So uh, thank you. And um, Lois? I, I agree. I mean, the idea, I mean, yes, there's been a 30 year disinvestment, but um, I, I, I don't think that we can have a 30 year reinvestment. Um, and uh, so obviously we need to attack more quickly than, than 30 years. Um, and in terms of uh, building capacity, I mean, the only way, I mean, that, or the principal way that we'll build capacity to do some of these things that hopefully we will agree on um, is through um, a disinvestment in the police and a reinvestment or in things that are as have now fallen to the police. Um, so I think that we can't have one building capacity without um, disinvesting in the police. And um, in terms of um, a Department of Community Care, um, I like that idea. And, uh, but I think that it's gonna be, I hope that it will be to this commission, if not in this, you know, between now and from now or whatever, um, to come up with guideposts uh, if we do decide to recommend something like that for what the markers will be, what we would like to see happen or what we would like to see happen in a certain amount of time, whether it's in a year and then two years and then three years. And um, so that there's some, so that 
the work that we're doing will inform whatever that that uh, department will be, and that they're not starting from scratch. And I mean, I don't see them uh, necessarily um, uh, interfacing just with like the health department or the human rights commission, but the idea that they would build a constituency that's based in the community and that that community constituency um, as would be the advisory council. And I, I brought this up at our committee meeting, uh, spending committee, and I also brought it up again today at the uh, alternative committee, that there is this precedent and that's the Arts Council. And um, they have, then the Arts Council is the advisory committee to uh, the Arts Council. And uh, they raise money, they spend money, they make grants, they make they make grants to individuals. Um, and so they exist in the city uh, and also um, create their own programs. And so, I mean, they're, they're a precedent or a model, uh, not in terms of content, but maybe in terms of form uh, for what this might be. But I don't see us handing over saying, okay, we think this is a great idea, go figure it out after we've spent six months, however many there are of us, uh, trying to um, make some recommendations. So I think that needs to be part of it. I'm, I'm not seeing any other hands raised. So I just wanted to follow up with Lois is that um, having a department is something that the that the spending and contracts subcommittee has thought about um, and sort of brought up in our meetings and sort of thought about, okay, so where, where do we have funds available in the city? Um, specifically looking at reinvestment. Um, and so, you know, what, <laughs> what resources um, can we make sure are dedicated to this? Um, and then sort of thinking, you know, sort of broadly armchair style about like what the scope of that that department would be and like what you know what it could house what it could do if it was micro grants and is there you know is there a precedent for that in the city um, to start up and pilots um, is there direct direct assistance that could be provided to residents um, are there um, are there funds somewhere um, in there that we can earmark um, so um, you know like but we're also you know, for any of these, we need to know sort of where we are on a, as a commission, what we're recommending to then say, okay, so this is, you know, maybe this is how much you would need to start up. Um, and like, I mean, these are sort of thoughts to have is like, what is the cost of starting up a new department um, that's gonna live within the city? How many people do you need to start a community care department? Um, even rough estimates or ideas um, for what those models are so that then we can say, this is what you need and we've looked through and maybe this is some of where that money can come from. Um, you know, and what, what we might recommend is a reinvestment um, because that becomes, you know, as I think one of, the, one of the things that a lot of people have brought up is that if we don't have specific recommendations, things are likely to get either lost, mistranslated or not done. Um, so I think that's gonna be a process in and of itself. Um, and I want to open the floor for Nick. Uh, am I unmuted? Yep. Okay. Um, I, I, this is really, um, th this is great stuff. This is really, um, having some, something in writing to respond to, beginning a discussion of, um, uh, you know, specific ideas and also what are, what are underlying values. The, this, is, this is the work of the commission. The, what I wanna raise is um, we we're looking for an interim report. I'm, I'm not clear, this seems to be the kind of stuff we really need 
some more time with and we need to time with each other and we need to be putting out the kind of ideas that are coming up right now. And I'm, I'm wondering if, if people are thinking of this as an interim report, um, which I'm not clear about, but it, it, I think that we need to say we're working on this stuff rather than, than getting down to the specifics, which could morph in any of a number of ways. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of bringing up a process question of are we, how, how do we want to work on the interim report? And I want to add one more thing. As I, the alter, I've been following the alternatives committee, I only have so much time to spend on the, watching the committees, but I feel like we're starting to get convergence in, in activities between, certainly between the policies committee and the um, alternatives committee, um, convergence in areas that we're looking at. And I, I, I feel like that's also a direction we need to look at how to share, start bringing some of that stuff closer together. Um, but the most immediate question is, is what, what, how do we ag agree on a process for an interim report? That's, that's what's on my mind right now. I mean, I think, you know, I'll speak to that just myself. I think I, I sort of still see this as a progress report. A, it's very preliminary to say, this is the work that we've done. These are the avenues that we are exploring, but this is far from a final recommendation. These are, I mean, we the, the mandate was to explore, you know, 20 odd different, um, different broad topics. And we've added to that list, I think considerably in response to both our own um our own understandings of what the problems that the city faces are um, but also to in response to public comment and concerns so um i don't think that i don't see this as holistic i mean through the document that um, they shared and i will admit that i just skimmed it <laughs> uh, this afternoon i didn't really read it i was in so many meetings um but it seemed like it was a lot of proposal like these are things that we've explored these are proposals that we could make um, but that it wasn't necessarily specifics yet. Um, and I don't think at least from my knowledge of the, the contracts and spending that we're ready to make a lot of specifics. Um, I think we are ready to say, um, that we would like to see reinvestment in the community as a broad <laughs> statement and that there are some pressing issues, um, which may have even been dealt with at this point. Um, around like housing and, and warming shelters and things like that. But, um, you know, with just reinvestment from the 10% that was cut previously, but that doesn't get us anywhere to what we would like to see the future happening. Um, so I welcome anyone else to speak on that um, as well, or Nick, if that helps you in your thinking. It, it does help me. I, I may end up agreeing with you after I've read it. I haven't really had, had a chance to read it and it's too too small on my screen right now to for me to really read read and I'm only getting little bits and pieces but I it it looks very interesting I just I, I don't know if it's ahead of where the the commission is or not that's kind of what my question is um, if it is just kind of these are general areas that we're looking at I, I am in agreement that 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 that's worthwhile mentioning uh, to, to, to the scope of, of all the things that we're watching right now. Um, so Lois and then Alex. I don't, I don't think that, uh, I, I couldn't say if it's ahead of the commission or behind the commission, because I don't think we can say what the commission as a body thinks. So I, I maybe it's, you know, head in some ways of, somebody and behind in some ways. And uh, I just don't think uh, it's possible to say that because at least I don't know that. And uh, and I've been going to a lot of these meetings and uh, I don't know that. Um, uh, so that's one thing. Um, the other thing is uh, there uh, in the meeting this morning, I suggested a sort of a big long list of other things that areas 
that involved the police and policing. And uh, I, I guess there wasn't time to add those in the future, whatever the category was, things to be pursued. Uh, but I, I hope that uh, when this does get circulated again, that those other things get added to it um, because they're not they're not here in those. When it comes to the end of the document, there they there aren't they, they aren't there. Um, there was something else I was going to say, but now I don't remember what it is. Uh, but. Um, I, I just can't remember what it is. I, I'll remember as soon as I, I'm, as soon as I meet myself. I'll remember. Okay. Um, so Alex. And then Booker has his his physical hand raised. Um, yeah. So I wanted to make sure people saw that there is in the chat. Um, Noah put a link to the document. So if you want to just bring it up on your home screen, you can do that. Um, and then. Yeah, I tried to write uh, my my section at least in terms of, you know, I, I think I did kind of put a lot of like we believe, uh, and that 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 may not be reflective of um, what the commission as a whole. Or although I think it's it's likely that the subcommittee uh, do, does does have consensus or close close to on some of those, um, but. We can change that to say we are considering. We are, you know, if we're not ready for that, but in a way, I, I like the idea of sort of saying of, of saying, okay, here's something to push off of to for your to get your feedback on, and um, and we'll modify that as we need to in order to get uh, either consensus or majority or however we are going to actually make a decision about uh, what the preliminary report is. But yeah, it's to me it does feel like a progress report. Um, what we've considered, what we feel strongly about, what we know we have to still have to do. And then Booker. Yeah, I can't, for some reason, I can't find my way back to where the raise hand symbol is with everything else up on the screen. I'm, um, I'm something of an incrementalist. Um, all of the pro policies and programs I've been able to make in terms of organizational institutional change have all been incremental rather than um, different than that. Um, so, and I've got to say that the things that I were write, was writing about were things that I thought were low hanging fruit and could easily be done, but would still be radically different. And I'm glad that Nick collects a lot of what we've done because a lot of the ideas have frankly come from conversations I've had with him and with other people and also things that have come from the community. Um, a lot of some of the specific suggestions are things that have been taken from reports that have already been done by the city council. There are recommendations there that come from the panhandling committee. There are recommendations that come from the resiliency report and not a whole lot of stuff is happening with those things. And they've got some pretty specific recommendations in them that we refer back to too. Um, so this is getting to, are we gonna be the next report that is published and sits someplace? And that's why I've gotta say, I'm more focused on stuff that should be quite deliverable, that also has a lot of data for the change. And there's a lot of experience with it. And it, it's, you know, it's not abolish. It's not abolish the police. It's make asking for a big change with what's going on and what hurts people and improving public safety. I, I'm also saying what I think along with what I'm doing. But um, you know, Lois did a really good job of pointing out to us stuff, the beginning, the tip of the iceberg of stuff that we didn't deal with. I think we spent a lot of time talking about what we've talked about a lot. So we've not talked about resource officers in the schools. We've not talked about a, a really important issue to me, Lois, the um, differences in policing if you live in public housing than if you live in Florence. Um, uh, some of our public speakers have also brought that up. So these are all things to work on, but I, I've got to say, 
I'm most comfortable writing about what I think is deliverable. Um, um, and that's where I've sort of set the focus. The one thing that I'm also feeling is you can't find Black Lives Matter in what we've written so far. And as I'm about to re-edit, I'm trying to find a way that that becomes more pronounced. The data that we have from the city of Northampton does not break down in terms of race. Um, I'm hoping that what we hear from the other policing data will give us more information about that. Um, I am not yet happy with the number of people of color faces speak to us in public comment. Um, I still feel like too many white faces are telling me about what's going on. Um, and that's why I'm really glad that the subcommittee is gonna meet though. I, I think it's gonna be a real challenge to figure out how they'll get that those voices into the room. So those are things that I'm thinking about that, that our current version of the report doesn't do well enough with. Um, you know, and if others have ideas about how to improve that, I, I'd be very welcome to even if hearing about it via email offline. Um, so thank you, uh, Lois, and then Javier, and then I'll throw myself in at the end as well. The one thing that I think is missing uh, from this statement or this interim progress report, whatever we're going to call it, is to reiterate that, uh, and I think we all agree on this, uh, that any money that um, will be redirected from the police uh, go to uh, these different programs that they won't go to uh, pay off, you know, what wasn't taken in by the traffic, uh, 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 traffic ticket, uh, parking ticket, uh, which $300,000 went to that from the money that was uh, taken from the police budget. And uh, that to me is a really, really unfortunate um, uh, thing uh, that all of the hundreds of people that spoke about it and also the council, I don't think anybody thought that the money that was going to be uh, taken from the police budget was going to go to supplement uh, the number of parking tickets that weren't given out because of COVID. And I don't know what's gonna happen with the rest of that money, but it's sitting there in the midst of this. And I would hate to see that happen again. And I think we need to say really clearly that uh, if money is reduced from the policing budget, um, that it go to some of these um, non-policing um, responses that we keep talking about. Uh, then the other thing I just want to mention is some of the things that I mentioned this morning was that that aren't in here yet, and hopefully they will be in terms of alternatives, um, is a, a, a different response or a completely different set of procedures to sexual violence. And Elizabeth spoke at length about this, I think, last week, and she was really right. And also, um, a citizen complaints of the police. I brought this up. I mean, to complain to the police about the police seems bizarre. And, um, uh, and to me, that's part of uh, something else that we need to talk about as an alternative. And, um, and then also just other things, like, I mean, I, I keep talking about public housing, people that, the policing that goes on uh, with people that are unseen, uh, not only people that are uh, on the street. And to think of the, all of those categories of people, which is where the majority of the policing, I think, does go on. I mean, direct one-to-one -one policing. Um, and, um, 
And then also I just want to mention just the whole area of harm reduction and something that's come up a lot in the city, but we haven't mentioned is uh, not just needle exchange, but safe injection sites. So I just want to throw those out there as other alternatives that um, we've discussed that uh, so far aren't in this uh, in this initial report. Thank you. Um, so next up is um, Javier. Yeah, um, I, I just want to clarify a couple of things. So um, what you're seeing written over there, it's what we talk. We so far, and I assure you, we would love to do it, but we cannot write about things that we have not dived into it. Right, that, that's worth thing. And also just this a preliminary report. Um, the subcommittee have, we even have been talking about the creation of a section about the future topics that we're gonna, we're gonna address. And we have been doing it from the last couple of meetings. Uh, I mentioned domestic violence, Alex also does it. I mentioned sexual abuse in, a, in just to put it there as, as a topic. Um, and I think this is, this is sort of important to the fact that uh, people making time to go to other subcommittees, right? Uh, so they are not taken by surprise about, well, it's missing this. Well, you know, we talked about that like two meetings ago and we decided we were going to put it in sort of next things that we're going to address after we deliver the preliminary report. Um, one of the things that we have not talked because, you know, I, I do feel that it's, it's an ideological decision that belongs to the wider commission is in the relationship of redirecting the money from the police department to anything that we would be proposing. And that's, and, and again, those are the decisions that the commission has to, the wider commission has to do. Because if not, at the end of the day, we can, we can have an idea from where the money have to come from. I, I'm totally on board with getting money out of cops into all these services. But um, uh, maybe another committee is uh, they are thinking in a different way. So there, there, there is not a unified decision across the board how to, we're going to approach this. And that's something that a subcommittee cannot decide. Has to be the wider committee commission. Um, what else? Um, yeah, I think uh, hold on. I think that's it. Okay, um, so I know I said I was going to go next, but Elizabeth put up right at the same time. So Elizabeth, I'll see to you and then go after you. Um, can you can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I think um, one of the things I just wanted to to add is that uh, the idea behind just it's trying to bring us back to get to the decision points to <clears throat> when it comes to this report and all the different subcommittee reports um, it looks like there's you know the pieces around the recommendations you know the actual recommendations of each of the subcommittees uh, which I, I again think is embedded in a, in a discussion about values that we haven't had but there's the recommendations um, there's a piece around funding because I don't some of these recommendations don't mention funding actually a lot of them don't and that's something that you know e each of these things have to we have to address the idea of what the funding looks like for each one of them and how uh, funding is 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 moved from uh you know the policing model into these into whatever other recommendations we have the other thing is timing and i know we talked about incremental and what that means and phases and I think all of those decision points are ones that um, we're going to, you know, first of all, I, I, the, uh, do we agree that those are the decision points? And, and, and I, I think that those are all going to be uh, points of, um, uh, of contention because we have to coming into it from different philosophies. And, uh, you know, I think for me, when it comes to phasing and incremental and all these pieces, you know, I, you know, 
my, my, you know, my background is working with, with, uh, with, you know, philanthropy and making large investments in, in, in ideas, uh, ideas that, to bring about change and not, you know, it's, it's not a single time that we talk about like, well, let's do a small amount of money to, to bring about a big change. I mean, that's, or, or the timing of it is always in two to three year periods. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that one of the, one of the rules we go by is that, you know, people almost always overestimate what they can do in a year, but they underestimate what they can do in 10. And so I think when we're looking at, you know, what the recommendations are, you know, a 30 year horizon, what you're looking at is a generation, you know, maybe even two generations. And that in and of itself is, is um, you know, um, again, we're, it's problematic in terms of what we think we're actually doing here uh, to recommend a, a generational shift, um, especially when justice is being demanded now. Um, I, I like what Booker said around the, um, the piece around centering Black Lives Matter and any of these recommendations. I mean, that's why we're here. And I think it would be, um, it, it, I think it's critical of us to be able to make sure that we are centering the, you know, that as part of the recommendations. Um, yeah, that's all. Yeah, I think I'm gonna sort of follow up, um, you know, from my own perspective and my own sort of hopes, dreams, and aspirations for this is that we are able to make, I would say, big recommendations um, and propose big change um, and to still have milestones, but, and to appreciate, you know, things can be incremental, but they can also be large, right? If there is will and there's, you know, if there's a will behind it, we can have those larger changes Quickly. And I'm not saying to do anything rash or foolish, um, but to really push for the changes that we know, um, or at least that we have good sense that they've worked in other places, that these interventions have, um, you know, pretty consistent um, calls for them over time, um, you know, with respect to the fact that our context might be a little different, but that Northampton for all of its unique charm is not necessarily, um, you know, fundamentally different from other locations. Um, but that we have a chance, I mean, we use the term progressive all of the time, either, <laughs> either as, a, as a compliment or we're patting ourselves on the back or we use it as an insult to point out how progressive we are in Northampton. Either way, we do have a chance to say we can be progressive and look to be at the forefront of some of these things. And I don't think it's wrong to say, yes, we should. Um, again, this is my perspective. So this is where I'm coming from. Um, is that big change can happen too. Um, and that sometimes incremental change ends up being, you know, death by a thousand cuts for those larger, those larger end goals. Um, but that, you know, if we can engender, you know, commitment from both the, the mayor to make the sort of executive branch decisions that need to happen, uh, because a lot of power does sit under, um, under his office, but also to look at what the city council can do. So exploring different ways that they can also implement and affect change so that it's not just one group, it's it's a multi-group push um, to have to make these things reality, whatever we do end up recommending. So that's where I that's where I stand on that. Um, Carol, I see your hand up, so I'll see it to you. So I I just wanted to go on record saying that uh, you know the the concept of thirty years of change was certainly not what I was suggesting when I suggested that it had taken thirty years to really um, devolve. You know, it was a process of devolution of social welfare benefits and and direct services that presumably could go could be wrapped into this. Um, community care uh, department. Um, I, I'm please understand that I'm not suggesting that we go so in that our recommendation is to go so incremental that we're looking over decades because I, for one, would like to have some of our what may be viewed as aspirational language about what we want to see in the way of change and disinvestment in police and reinvestment in, in these other areas, I'd like to see it start right now. 
And, you know, one of the delightful things that I find in Lois's and other people's ideas of, about this, you know, making recommendation for the creation of a new department is that if you know anything about bureaucracy, if, if, if once that, first of all, that's language that people who you work in municipal government will understand. You know, it sort of translates what activists are, are telling us into uh, an entity, if, it's, if it really is created, um, that's not gonna go away. You know, a new department is unlikely, once established, once funded, is not gonna go away. And you can shape it from there and build initiatives out of it. So I really kind of like the idea of our considering, and, and I'm not sure everybody's on board with this yet, you know, considering that um, beyond what we all end up writing in our respective sub committees and put it together into the, the preliminary document um, or even the final document, that, that somewhere in there, there, there be uh, a strong recommendation for a creation of, uh, of a new department. Because I think then it, it sets up, sets in motion that um, we pull some of the, the city pulls some of the money each year, um, decides to allocate money that would have gone to police because I think by default, police got to do a lot of these things that I would like to see in another department, the, the community ca uh, care department. So, so I kind of, I like the aspirational language. I think we're gonna have to have agreement across, as Javier has said, it's across the commission. It's not just a subcommittee. Uh, some of it is aspirational, but I think it's consistent. A lot of what we're saying here is consistent with, with you know, some of the values that I understand that reflected and, and quoted within this community. And, um, but, but to do something that the bureaucracy will, will understand, like i.e. creation of this new, new department, um, I think is a way to really build out and reinvest in the areas that we are talking about wanting to reinvest in. Thank you. Um, and then Elizabeth, your hand is up. I don't know if that's a legacy from before or not. Okay. <laughs> sorry. No, yeah, sorry. All right. Um, so I think I would like to add just to that, um, thinking about like the things that can't be stopped. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, that in a lot of this, I think one of the things that we've, we've talked about um, we sort of imagined or talked about like getting buy-in from folks and all that. And I think one of the other things, and I know we've talked about leadership and where, you know, where, where could we house um, leadership for something that's outside of the existing branches of government, um, right? So, you know, if the mayor has oversight, could we have an advisory council over that? If, um, is there a way to involve the city council and leaders there or community leaders and things like that? Um, but I think one of the other parts of this is also to consider accountability um, and the ability to change or pivot. So I think this is something that we had sort of brought up as we could still have, you know, ultimately a goal of either, you know, the reduction of police or the removal of police, you know, completely if we're talking about reforms that happen over time towards, you know, a particular goal, if it's just overall reduction and reform, is it actually abolition that's further down the road? Um, but these goals, but to still build in checkpoints to say after, and I'm not going to go 30 years. I don't think I have the capacity to think about a 30-year plan. Um, but you know, even if we're talking about you know a six six month, one year, you know, 18 month sort of check-in back, either looking at what exists um, now, what the context is that we're all living in, the reality. Um, certain certain things change abruptly. Um, thinking about nine months ago. Um, but there's more to it than that, right? Because if we're looking, you know, we could still establish a process of every couple of years, uh, if you're saying, if we go with this department idea, right? So build it into the, the foundation of that department that they reassess what, they're, what, they are, what they are currently doing and does that reach, you know? So I don't think we necessarily have to specify, you know, 30 years or 
even 20 years, but if we specify the end goal and give them a process by which to review and reiterate, I think that's gonna be really helpful. Um, mm -hmm. Next is David and then Elizabeth. Yeah. Um, first of all, Carol, uh, thank you for defending yourself. I never heard you say 30 years we were going to stick this out to. So uh, I'm glad you clarified that. Um, you know, I probably what I'm going to say is not going to be very popular, but, um, you know, this, uh, first of all, let me say that the, the, the document that's been up on the screen and that uh, I reviewed uh, um, pretty pretty carefully. I, I was very impressed with the amount of work that went into it. Um, and I personally agreed with nearly 100% of what was in there. Um, having said that, it, it in my mind is way beyond what we need for an interim report. I thought an interim report was going to be you know, four or five pages. Uh, these are the things we're looking at. Here are some ideas we're looking at. And um, this is the time frame, perhaps, that it will take to resolve them. Um, I thought that it read uh, like um, a sociology a paper, critique of 21st century uh, post capitalist America. Um, I agreed with it all, um, probably most of you did too, but when this gets out into the broader community, I'm afraid that if we don't limit ourselves and cabin ourselves to the police department, what the police do and what they shouldn't be doing, if we start talking about the need for housing first, for um, needle exchanges, for um, food scarcity. I mean, these are all things that we understand are related to the need for police. Yet, I think that if we, if this commission gets into all these related social, uh, sociological realms, I'm afraid we're going to get written off as just the, the left-wing kooks that the, that the mayor and city council appointed, and we're gonna be one of those commissions that Booker talked about that nothing ever happens with. So I, I just would think that we should really keep to the task um, at hand. Um, we all, I, I thought the introduction was, was, was great. This is why we were here because what we have been doing as a society with policing does not work. It does not work for black and brown people, particularly who continue to be murdered by the police. So we have to make, make uh, those changes and um, focus on the areas that police do that they don't have to be doing. So that's, that's my two cents. I would just strip everything down uh, much more than it is. Thank you, um, Elizabeth. Uh, just a quick response to that. I, I, I feel that we keep going back and forth between, you know, stripping stuff down to, to, you know, uh, as you mentioned, um, David, around just the police, what they should shouldn't be doing, what we, what we alternatives to what we we want them to be doing. Um, there's that argument, but I've also equally heard uh, over the past year people criticize uh, the city council or the mayor to say, you know, how can you just cut from the police? How can you just do that without an alternative? You know, what are the alternatives? Um, and and wanting um, deeper recommendations around um, what, uh, you know, around mental health and other things. And so I kind of feel like we're in that, you know, catch 22 kind of place. And it, because I keep hearing it go back and forth, you know, one way or the other. And, uh, you know, along those lines, I, I just feel like we, um, we can't be so concerned about, about um, uh, you know, kind of overthinking about what, um, 
you know, what, what, you know, that, that particular piece, because it's just, it, again, it keeps going back and forth, whether or not, you know, there's too much in here, or we just limit to the police, and we haven't, um, you know, addressed where the, the other services go. So I, I, I just, just to you know, point that out. But the other piece I wanted to, um, uh, to point out is the, you know, the discussion around the department. Um, I just have a question around, you know, who would this department be responsible to? You know, who would, who would this department's boss be? And, I, and I'm, you know, curious about the relationship that we'd be setting up between the mayor, the department, and the mayor's relationship with the um, police chief. You know, so in that world that we have this city department and a city bureaucracy, I, I just, you know, again, thinking about the types of bold recommendations we I'm urging, you know, I urge that we consider and we put forward. I just don't, you know, city departments are not known for implementing bold things. And so, especially in relation to the mayor and, and other, you know, other, you know, um, kind of institutional pieces. So I'm just wondering, you know, how does a department head implement bold um, changes when they are, you know, accountable to, um, an elected official, and also, um, you know, what that elected official's relationship is to the, the police department. So I guess I'm just want to put that question out there as well. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, so I want to respond to that and also um, talk about recommendations a little bit. Um, I think one of the things is that if there's a new city department, like the, the charter <laughs> um, says that the mayor gets to oversee that. Um, so one of the things that we then have to look at is what can we implement to sort of make sure that the accountability is there for the community and not just the one position of the mayor. Um, and so that was um, where we start to think about like advisory councils, um, so citizen advisory councils and other things that might, um, you know, might give us that that additional lens, um, but also to explore what the city council could do, what changing the ordinances could do, um, and, and exploring that route, which is also going to take a lot of time because we need to balance both the ordinances, ordinance changes of the of Northampton, but also what that means in relation to Massachusetts general law as well. So it's it's not an easy or or light task. Like it's a good idea. Um, don't don't get me wrong. I'm for that idea, but it, it is going to take a lot to research to find that, and then to to be able to make a recommendation that does maximize accountability to the community, not just to one elected official, or even several elected officials. Um, but I think that what I did want to respond to, um, and I appreciate um, the idea of making smaller recommendations um, and centering it, but I think we also run into the problem that a lot of the reasons why the police have the footprint that they do have now, I mean, both because we've criminalized poverty and we've <laughs> criminalized um, being in a minority group in a lot of different ways. Um, and I don't think this commission is gonna have a perfect solution for any of that, but um, that, you know, when we're saying we want them to do less, um, you know, they did become the de facto responses. So we do need to have some form of recommendation to say what, <laughs> what happens now. Um, so, you know, if we're saying that the police are no longer who you call because there's someone who's unhoused uh, in a park, um, right, which is a perfectly reasonable thing to say. First off, why do you need to call anybody? But assuming that that, that structure still needs to exist, or maybe you want to call because you're concerned about them or about their health. Or if we're talking about wellness checks, you know, who performs those when the police aren't involved? Um, all of those things. And I mean, this is a big issue, right? The police have become the sort of locus of a lot of, you know, community interventions, and disentangling them is going to be a complex process. Um, I do also appreciate, and this is something that we've heard lots of comment about, is make recommendations um, that are very clear, you know, crystal clear, that are really, you know, concise. And I'm not sure how to balance all of that myself. Um, and I think we're all sort of struggling with that in some different, in some way. Um, so I think it's going to be important that we balance that going forward. Um, 
in terms of what we recommend or how far we go. And it could be that we have, you know, sort of immediate recommendations and, you know, sort of the and beyond that. <laughs> so immediate recommendations that are just related to the police department within itself and the structure, its footprint, and then the direct services that are related, but then the broader concerns as well. Um, you know, it could be that we have minority and majority reports, although that's not really my, <laughs> that's not really my preference, but that could be another structure as well. Um, you know, if we can't come to consensus ourselves. Um, so I think there's, there's room for, um, there's room for discussion about what the scope is of what we're doing as well. Um, all right. Uh, I think we've spent a lot of time and gone. I'm sorry, oh, Elizabeth, did you still have your hand up again? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I think we've talked a lot about um, across the different committees as, or the subcommittees as well, even though this was primarily for or related to the um, alternatives. Um, but just to give everyone a chance to speak, um, do we have updates from the um, policies and services committee or the, uh, well, I guess we'll start with policies and services and then go to spending and contracts. We'll just keep it all alphabetical. I suppose I could start to summarize for the policies and services. Um, um, we as a committee um, agree that I would sort of get us started with the talking up for our committee, but that I wouldn't speak for everybody um, because sometimes I may not fully uh, recall or emphasize where people uh, stand. But we did meet in the last week, and as I, we indicated in a previous meeting, um, we had tasked, uh, each of us had agreed to sort of uh, take a different bite of the, the apple, so to speak, the apple being existing policies and services offered by Northampton Police. Uh, we, each of us, elected to take a close look um, at the website or other sources and then report back to the committee. And so we had a meeting where we talked about, you know, the one I did was um, the school resource officers, um, but others in the committee spoke to traffic, um, spoke to the mental health services, spoke to housing, spoke to domestic violence, spoke as well to um, addressing sexual assault. Um, and in each case, we kind of outlined what, um, is happening within the police department uh, currently. And we did take a kind of a step into the, um, the world of the alternatives because what we had sort of said we'd do is to try to, um, as we discussed what was happening in Northampton currently, if there was a model out there that we thought would be um, a, a good contrast, you know, so just for example, just one random example comes to mind now and talking about traffic, you know, there was a lot of discussion about how, uh, we could get police to be less involved in traffic stops, a recognition that in these routine traffic stops, that's where sometimes things have gone terribly wrong for people of color. Um, and could these things be replaced by you know, more civilian um, action? It was pointed out that already once upon a time, police may have been involved in um, writing tickets for parking meter violations. And now that work is not done by police, but is done by other people. So was that, could that be a model for other uh, routine things? But it was, uh, the city of Berkeley was invoked as one place that has a, a bold program to try to replace police uh, who normally do traffic with more civilian options. So that's the kind of thing we talked about. I, I don't think I'm going to try to elaborate on everybody's summaries, everybody's points, but I would say that we, we at the end of the meeting, uh, all heard each other out. And uh, I think we're trying to work towards having something to contribute to the interim report. So we'd all generated you know, documents for each of our areas where we kind of in a page or two um, summarized. So does anyone else from the committee feel like they want to convey something specific that we got to that, um, or did I misrepresent anything that anybody um, felt that we discussed that should be brought to everyone's attention before we take questions? Anybody want to chime in? Uh, uh, well, let me chime in, but if anybody else has anything to say, please contribute it. Um, the, I just want to say we, we started off by focusing on policies and there are a couple of policy areas that we we want to um, pursue further, and but we've moved on from that, feeling like like we don't need to spend a lot of time on the policies. That services are really um, more fundamental to the uh, uh, to the mandate of the commission. The two policy areas that kind of were outstanding. There might be others. 
but one is the grievance complaint procedure. We really want to stick with that and, and follow that through. Um, and the lack of a, a, a parent citizen um, uh, oversight or, or, or component of that. And then the other is a strategic plan. But then moving on to services, I think that uh, uh, we're starting to um, have a little bit of parallel work um, with the alternatives committee, um, but not exactly. I think that our emphasis is slightly different. Um, and, um, but, but uh, I think that we need to have a conversation about how to um, kind of share information between the two committees. That's all I would add to what you said, Mandy. Anybody else from our subcommittee want to share something that, that, that uh, you think that would be a value to the whole um, mission? And um, they're just, uh, I'm thinking just what popped into my head, uh, I'll throw out there because I'm, think, I'm think, seeing Lois and, and I'm remembering that in the commission meeting when I was going over the school resource officer information, this just as one example, you know, I began by pointing out that uh, I learned in that process that the existing law in Massachusetts requires chiefs of police to appoint a school resource officer in most school districts. I didn't know that was the case. And I got, went through the history of kind of what had happened in Northampton, both with appointing the officer that we had in the schools and how that person um, was removed, both by a vote of the um, school committee, but also because of the budget cuts. But in any event, Lois Lo pointed out that there's legis active legislation that, that is trying to reform that particular rule. And, and so, um, and then it, it sort of has gone back and forth on the governor's desk. But the basic issue is the question of, is it a requirement? It, does the state require us to have school resource officers? Currently, it's written that it is required, but there, that's been actively challenged and, and it's likely that it will be overturned. So it then becomes a choice of any given district, whether they want a school resource officer or not. But I think the work of our commission is trying to understand what's sort of baked in, what, what are the existing policies, procedures that we can't navigate around? Um, what, what, you know, kind of what's the status of these things? And that the school resource officer is one example, but Nick went through the mental health, you know, kind of, uh, what's existing currently in Northampton, kind of what training is currently going on, how are they handling things, you know, in the present, we did the same for domestic violence and other kinds of things. Um, but but I think we, what we see as uncharted territory now, or that we'd like to get definitely deeper into would be the, what Nick outlined about grievances um, and also about citizen um, accountability. I mean, I think those are all, those are two issues. But it, does anybody else feel like from our commission wanna highlight something that um, we feel like we covered that would be useful for other people to hear? Okay. Just anyone. So we're certainly open to any questions that the broader commission has for our committee as well. Um, Dan, were you gonna ask something? I, yeah, I was just, I mean, thinking about, and like thinking about like the school resource officer, um, you know, because there are communities like Amherst, which, you know, the city filed a resolution saying we don't want this. Yeah. And so one of the things that comes up with a lot of this, and I don't, I'm trying to think of the way to, to phrase this, that I think part of it lends itself also to what are the ways, so recognizing that there may be requirements set forth by the state um, and not just Northampton itself, but what are the means that Northampton has to disagree um, or work? I don't want to say circumvent, but it is. How no. can we circumvent to make it match the values of the community? Yeah, so I'm sorry, I, I, I probably I misspoke. And I'm not sure exactly, I, I was just a little bit reluctant to kind of, I was thinking about how long our, our one hour long meeting took and I was not trying to, I knew at some level we couldn't repeat all the details, but I think I omitted some important details. So Dan, what you just brought up, so I wrote a one page thing that I made make available to everybody about the school resource officer. And one important piece of that was uh, every uh, chief of police is supposed to appoint a school resource officer unless they apply for some kind of exception. So, so I, I didn't say that it was important to say it, that there is a, but, but that still puts it a burden like on the, you know, on the chief of, on the school to say they want to opt out. Hopefully this will all get overturned and it'll be just optional everywhere. But it's it's good to kind of know what the existing policies are. Like we brought up a similar question about like qualified immunity and like what are these things that kind of are constraining us? And I think Dan, you're quite right. How do we get around them? But it, it's good to know when you have sort of the law like you know um, sort of at your back, or whether you're going to be fighting uphill against some kind of policy. 
that mandates that you take something that, that because our group has sort of said that we have a we listed a bunch of low hanging fruit thing we things we thought we could get the police out of and the schools were brought up as one example but it was a surprise to see that actually the currently the commonwealth is saying every school district should have a school resource officer probably in response to the school shootings that was probably the thinking about it but the bottom line is uh, clearly in Northampton and also in Amherst, steps were taken to undo that and it can be undone. But it's, it's good to recognize that in a sense it's being forced on us and we have to like work. This one thing that struck me, for example, is that the way the law is written is that um, the position has to be sort of has to be funded. So it's, there's three pieces to it. The, the, the chief of police is supposed to name somebody, the superintendent of schools is supposed to help them pick the person and there needs to be money for the position. And when the budget was cut, the chief of police reassigned the school police officer in Northampton and the city of Northampton voted that they didn't want that person. But I was a little concerned, like let's say the budget got, money was found, would it automatically revert to a, a new appointment or do we need to do the work of recommending against that in some way? So I was just trying to drill down on what is the status of the school resource officer and what do we need to do to take a position on that? Because if we don't take a position, do we default back anytime there's money? You know, that, so the questions like that were on my mind. And so I, that's the kind of stuff that we're trying to get it. Like, what are the things that are happening and how are they held together and how do we take them apart if we want to take them apart? So that's just one example. And others might have other examples. I'm sure Nick went through a great deal about, about both mental health and also about, um, well, and, and David on, on traffic and other, other topics. Housing, housing was Nick's other thing, yeah. Thank you for that clarification. That's awesome. Yeah, sorry, that's a lot of detail, but I was trying to resist kind of do, we did that for every one of these topics. And so I was trying to say, let's, unless people, but if you have questions, more than happy to go into the detail. Um, awesome. So we have um, Javier and then Alex and then uh, Josie. Yeah, uh, just to clarify. So, um, so from, from the policing bill that is not the legislature, the, from when we're talking about use of excessive force, when we're talking about post, when we're talking about facial surveillance, the only piece that is not uh, under review that is untouched and looks like is extremely likely to pass is in relationship to the SRO. If that legislation passes next year, starting next year, uh, the school superintendent will have a to say if they are counting or not with a cop with a gun. I don't like to call it a school resource officer with a cop with a gun in a school. So, I mean, I, I, that's the kind of conversation that maybe you guys want to wait a little bit and and have it the first week of January because uh, to try to avoid a pocket veto, the legislator has to get things done by the 26th of this month. So. Just, just sort of giving that piece of information. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Alex and then Josie. Yeah, um, so yeah, I think there is some overlap between the committees and I appreciate hearing where those places are. And I encourage uh, each committee, if you find overlap uh, during your upcoming scheduled committees um, to comment, say on the draft that we sent um, and send those to us as a committee because um, you're able to do that when you're in a meeting. Uh, so that's one way where where we can have some some communication and some information and going back and forth. Thank you. Um, so Josie. Sure, I think I think that's a really interesting kind of mind space to be in when considering like what it is that we are recommending and what it is that we're not recommending, and do things default to that kind of place that nominee was kind of pointing to. Um, to that though, I think it's it's really interesting because the, the longer I spend here, the longer it, it, my eyes have been open to the fact that we are doing something uh, outside of a conventional form, something that's like happening now due to a spur and a movement. Um, founded by, you know, evidence and study after study that suggests X, Y, and Z. Um, but also, I think that the, I, I do believe that we have a good amount of wiggle room in the same way that, like, uh, there are legislatures that have, for example, not had uh, school resource officers, even though the law has said one thing. And I think it's really important for us all to know that, like, laws 
like are not inherently moral or good, right? For example, there is a time in United States history where slavery was legal, right? That was the law, but that doesn't mean that it's it's a good thing. So if we bump up against a few laws that are preventing us from from viewing what uh, what our commission is tasked with or what our uh, image of Northampton is moving forward, then I think that's fair for us to uh, to work in that sort of space where we bump up against things that have been quote unquote mandated uh, that were based on previous data that contradict the data that we are now gathering now and, and disseminating through that brought us to our decisions to want to push against said mandates or or, or law, for example, and I just think that's something that we should consider. That we that that it takes someone to move against the grain at some point for things to shift. If no one does it, things kind of stay in stasis, and the status quo remains. And what we are doing here is actively going against the status quo. And so I think that if we continue to do that, that it is ultimately fine uh, as long as there is an acknowledgement there. Uh, but maybe that's just me. Hey, thank you. Um... So I see, um, Alex, did you have your hand up still or was that again? Okay, so uh, Booker. So um, thanks for the beginning of the report. I'm, I have a practical question to ask, which is, you know, one of the things I feel guilty about is the alternatives committee has not gotten to the SRO issue in a real way. I guess what I want to ask is, can we leave it to your committee to continue to pursue that? Um, I, I also was curious about removing police from trafficking, but we haven't gone there yet. So can we keep that in your basketball court um, or in, in your committee? Don't, I don't want to use a sports metaphor. Um, are there other things that we're both working on that we ought to divide up or should we continue to work on together? Great question. So I can say I'm, I'm happy to, it, it, uh, in the spirit of efficiency to pursue uh, the school resource question and of course taking input from people like Javier and Lois who anybody who wants to contribute I can sort of be the, the collecting place for that and, and share it on the shared shared drive. Um, I wonder um, on housing um, oh, traffic traffic that David you did traffic do you want to say something about whether you want to um, take sort of leadership on traffic as Booker is asking. Uh yeah, I could uh, I could do that, um, and I'm sorry I was just distracted for a minute, so uh, I'm not sure exactly what I just agreed to. But okay. yeah, so uh, book you can restate it. But basically, he, he, we're trying to see if there are things that are being covered in our committee that have not yet been taken up by the alternatives committee. Can we agree essentially that that we would sort of take primary leadership? Is that Booker what you basically said that on traffic? It's something your group hasn't really looked at. Yes, David, you've already done a lot of legwork. Can can yeah. Booker count on you to kind of be the leader on traffic, given that you've already done? I'm happy to do that, but it's your your hometown right out in front, Booker. Okay. <laughs> I. That's okay. <laughs> so, so Berkeley was cited as one of the one of the better examples of an alternative to what David says we're currently doing in Northampton. Sure, I'll, I will do that. And then uh, the other places I thought there was overlap. There was. Cynthia, what, what is yours overlap? Yeah, uh, mine was domestic violence. And I think um, Booker, we're probably, or I probably came at it differently than you did. And so what I did was I just plowed through all the policies and procedures of the MPD um, just to see what was going on with domestic violence, which is, a, as we know, many cases are not reported. So. Um, so one, one thing that, that we discovered with the, uh, in 2019, with the 18,000 hours of training that has occurred at NPD, 159 of those were on domestic violence. So, you know, the next question is, okay, what was that training? But as so many people here have said, training means nothing. <laughs> um, so we're just, we're just kind of identifying what's there in policies and procedures. I think you've taken it a few steps farther to see what can be done about the issue within, um, within the community. So I'm not sure it's a handoff or not. I think we're coming at it from different perspectives. But if you want to take it, that's great. But um, I think we might want to ask you know, for some more information on domestic violence um, from NPD. 
So I I'm not sure if there's an overlap or not. No, uh, uh, just on domestic violence, I, I, let me just throw one thing in. Um, I believe I, I contributed something to the conversation that I don't know was um, well understood. So, you know, one of the hats that I used to wear was doing research with officers who identified themselves as having been through traumatic incidences in the line of duty. And one thing I pointed out to our subcommittee was that officers had cited domestic violence calls as among the, the kinds of calls they were most worried about, things happening to them, that they would not be not sure what they were walking into, uh, into these situations, whereas they might think they're there to rescue somebody who's called them, who's been, had some violence committed, but that person might, might turn against the officer essentially if the officer uses excessive force against somebody's spouse, it's not clear where the loyalties are going to be, even if the spouse called in a complaint, something like that. I just want to point out that, that, the, that these situations may be ones that, you know, among the many we look at, at like which ones, if we can get someone, an armed person, police may be relieved to find themselves not put in those situations if, there's, if there are alternatives. Um, and our, in our commission, we talked a lot about both for domestic violence and sexual assault. You know, can we imagine responding to those kinds of calls without an armed person being the person who shows up. You know, I think there was a real, there was a real discussion on both of those matters of, of you know, it, is this really a, a situation that, you know, in most common situations would we, would we need that? Would that escalate or not? So I don't know that we got to the specific alternatives. I think we, we thought of the alternatives committee as being the place for that. But I think we, we began to kind of ponder um, what is the role of the police officer, you know, given the policies that Cynthia laid out. Nick, uh, Nick, and then Booker. Booker, you want to go first? I, I, I want to. Well, I, I, let me just say real quickly, Booker. I feel like you've opened the door to some horse trading and and an exchange uh, uh, on on who's going to do what, and I, I think it's really facilitative. I uh, so when we when we got to housing. I feel like you guys are doing the heavy lifting on housing and that uh, that um, I'm going to pay attention to what you're doing on housing, but I feel like you guys have have the handle on that. I heard um, uh, 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 Pam Schwartz's presentation. It was very, very uh, informative. Um, and and so um, but um, and then mental health, I feel crosses um, crosses both uh, 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 subcommittees, and I'm glad to kind of be kind of um, stay attuned to what's happening in both committees at the same time. But I feel like um, that's that's there is a a big piece there. There is low hanging fruit. I, I don't actually. I'm getting tired of that term. But the I think that there's um, there's a, an overlap between our committees and I think it should continue as is. And I'm willing to really stay attuned to make sure that we're not missing what's happening uh, with each other. That's all I have to say about that. Um, can I go ahead, Dan? So, um, no, I agree with that, Nick. But so on the domestic violence, actually um, Alex wrote the section that's in the document that's there. I've got to say, I think we've pushed more towards looking at alternatives to the police responding. We have not looked at what are the police doing at the moment. So if you wanted to stay with what are the police doing at the moment, that's not, that's a separate thing. Um, I think we're more looking at uh, the current way of treatment and also looking at expanding. There are other kinds of treatment out there um, that, that are not really being utilized so much anymore. We're getting some advice uh, from some other individuals in the community. So if you kept with looking at how the police policies are about it, that's actually not, um, I, I have the assumption that it would be better if the police were not involved. Um, so we're not sort of sitting with that. Um, so if you wanted to continue that work, that will not, that will mesh with what we're doing, which is looking at alternatives to police presence for calls about domestic violence. Does that make sense? Um, 
So I don't know if anyone wants to respond specifically to that. Um, that was a question out there. Um, but then afterwards, we have Nick and Elizabeth in the queue as well. Mine's an old one. I, Cynthia, do you want to respond to that? I mean, I, I feel like uh, Booker's asking if, uh, if we can get more information or just kind of be, be really up on what the current practice is. Yeah, I think that's what you know. I was initially saying we're both same topic. We're going at it in different directions, and I don't think we'll be stepping on each other. So it sounds good to me, Booker. Thank you. Okay, um, and Elizabeth. Yeah, no, that, that sounds good. I think I think partly also this exploration around the policies piece, um, the current policies. Uh, it is um, also about um, really uncovering some of the arguments that are made around, uh, you know, for the police and for the robustness of a police department in, a, in Northampton. You know, oftentimes it's just, you know, things like domestic violence or sexual assault, um, things like that that are, feel very visceral are some of the arguments as to why we can't be without police. You know, can't be without the the type of department we currently have, um, and so part of this investigation is really to try to, um, you know, put some put some, you know, the data in fact to the, to that argument around, you know, what the current policy actually is, and um, you know, as we've discovered with, um, you know, for the for uh, rape and sexual assault, the policy is very vague and allows for a lot of variation, which is why people have experienced a wide variety of response. From, from the police in this manner. And so, you know, um, and also as, as Cynthia said, the amount of training that actually is devoted to any one of these pieces we've discovered is, is either non-existent or, or paltry um, along the same lines as, um, as people are talking about uh, police being skilled at de-escalating. We've heard that a lot at, during these meetings. And when you look at the actual amount of hours they spend on training for de-escalation, um, you know, your average uh, peer counselor at a high school probably has more hours of, of training and de-escalation than um, uh, the, the, this department is, is getting. So, you know, I think it is important to, to put the, the facts at hand, you know, to what we have um, out there. So part of this, you know, I think it, it you know, could help with the alternatives. I think that there's, um, you know, we, there's, a, there's a lot of good information out there about what alternatives are and the subcommittee is doing a great job with that as well. But part of this exploration around policy is to really um, just uncover the reality of what the police are actually, what they actually know, what they're actually doing um, and how they talk about what they're doing. Thank you. Um, so, book, uh, sorry, Namdi, Namdi and then Booker. Yeah, so I just wanted to maybe ask Nick if he could help um, in clarifying the lane that our subcommittee will stay in on mental health for the benefit of, of the other subcommittee. And I'd, I'll just sort of say as a, as a reader, as a listener to your report, Nick, and as a fellow um, psychologist, you know, licensed clinician, you know, I was interested in hearing about the quality, your assessment of the quality of training police officers are getting to assess mental health issues, like are they doing the standard training? Are they working with community mental health agencies? So to me, the kind of the description, especially in light of some of the things Elizabeth just said about like, when you look at training, you can have a reaction like, oh, this is poor training. You know, this, they're not doing the, the basics that they should be doing. They're not putting enough hours into de-escalation. So, so hearing Nick's report on what is the current state of training and preparation and the, way, the, the sort of the, the policies on paper for what the Northampton Police is doing with mental health, I think is, is valuable. Um, even if we then have the question of, are they really doing what they say they're doing and could they be doing better? And so that's what I would see certainly as part of the lane. I guess, Nick, I wonder if you would want to maybe describe in your own words what you think of as the scope of what our subcommittee should be doing on mental health and then what would be then left over or different than what Booker's group would be. I, I, just to think out loud, I feel like we're looking at two things. We're looking at what um, police uh, could um, uh, not do what they could pass on to uh, peers and professionals uh, and, uh, and a model for that. And I feel like we're pretty much in sync with the alternatives uh, subcommittee in starting to think about um, some kind of uh, department that, that 
could oversee a, 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 a different model. I do want to just mention for um, the larger commission that we also are focusing on dispatch as an, 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 a very important component of anything that, that um, of any model, because dispatch is the front door. It's, it's a, a very pivotal uh, uh, piece of the action. Um, and we, we probably need to learn a little bit more about that. As far as training goes, um, I, I think that it's far better than it used to be, but I still think that um, it's not clear what, training, um, what trainings are useful and what aren't. And I actually, I'm interested in looking into that more, but I think that um, they're doing some very good trainings, um, but, but some of the trainings are, may not be that useful. And, and I just, I, I don't know what other police departments are doing. I know they could use more, um, but they are, they are trying. They, I mean, they're, they've, they've shifted, they've added things. They're moving in a direction of uh, having a more responsive, uh, uh, yeah, a more capable uh, police force. But our, I feel like we've moved towards a stronger goal of trying to get things away from the police that they don't do so well and they don't need to be doing. I don't know if that answers you, Namdi. It's not as specific as I think I'd like to be. Right. Uh, yeah, and maybe Booker, uh, on your end, since you're the next person in your, if you can help us to see what, you, what you've been doing on mental health, that would maybe also help us kind of stay in our lane so we don't over, over step on your toes. Uh, I'll be, from my view, and I'm, uh, all of this is coming from my view, um, what I'm saying, I think we're looking more, we're just assuming we don't want police in the room. And so we're sort of looking at what's a different way of de delivering mental health services. And I totally agree with what Nick just said. In order to do that, 911 has to work as a triage for can who needs to be in the room with this person who's in trouble. Because um, at the moment, it's, on, it's the police are there with or without mental health professionals. Um, so that's the most important thing. I, I've got, I don't think our committee has been quite so concerned with um, what are the police doing and how are they doing it. And I, I think in the, if you guys kept that, I think we don't need to do what we were thinking of doing, which is asking the police to come talk to us about what they're doing and how they think they are doing with it. Um, and I guess that's something we can process if we find out. Can I just ask one more question though about, are you looking at substance abuse treatment services being offered by the police? Because that was, that came up today in our meeting. We haven't talked about it and I'm about to write a section to sort of start thinking about alternatives to that. But is that something that your committee is working on or looking at? Well, I was assigned the mental health piece, and I'm not. I'm not uh, viewing mental health as just mental health. It's it's behavioral health, and subst the DART team is is uh, in the policies, and it's it's in the uh, it's in several places uh, on the website, um, and it is part of the behavioral health response. And we know that substance use substance use and mental health issues uh, you often coexist. So yes, the answer is yes. Okay. Did I answer your question, Namdi? Okay. And then um, Javier. Thanks. I am I'm a little confused here. So I asked Namdi a couple of meetings ago. I don't remember if you guys were doing alternatives, and I was told no. And now this so i i i'm super confused now with this um also i think booker that as a subcommittee we need to talk about what things are we going to be doing or not and rather than telling them no you do this or that i think it's a committee subcommittee decision i was being honest with you i was looking forward to working some of the things that you want to pass to the other subcommittee so it's i think we are we're talking too much in a casual way about something that has to be more thoughtfully 
plan even more because of what each committee subcommittee was charged with. Um, uh, I don't know. I'm as I said, I'm extremely confused. I I would like to understand a little more if if what's going on. And um, Booker, I don't know if you want to respond or does anyone want to respond to that? I think what Javier says makes perfect sense. And I, I think I was a little too casual in my comments. And they deserve more discussion rather than a flip decision. Uh, that's, Booker, that's Booker at 14 hours into the day speech <laughs> rather than Booker at two hours into the day speech. Yep. Uh, Namdi? Yeah, fair, Javier makes a good point. And I, you know, I, I think that there has been some mission creep in our subcommittee, um, as, and I can see how it would sound like we are sort of stepping on the toes of the alternatives committee. That I guess again, the best defense that I can make, and not not that we need one, but I, I, not that we deserve one, essentially, because I, I do think we've cre crept a little bit into into the area. But I would say that the purpose that it served to consider some alternatives was it helped us to make sense of what we thought about the current policies that Northampton was doing. Like I, I felt like what happened is we wanted to say. Here's what Northampton does with traffic. And, and in order to understand whether that is state of the art, good, there was a need to kind of say, well, they could be doing this. But it was what we didn't try to cover everything else they could be doing. But I think people, everybody who was presenting felt they wanted to talk about some kind of alternative, really just as a way to kind of put the current practices into some kind of context. But I agree that it's confusing and it sounds like it over overlaps with the alternatives committee. So that, I just want to acknowledge that. I don't know what other people in our committee or outside would say to that about like how you would justify why we're talking at all about alternatives on our committee. I'm not sure how else we would explain it. Nick, do you want to? I, I, I think that, um, I don't think it, it's necessarily mission creep. I think, I think we need to be very, very cognizant that, that well, the alternatives committee is the home of, 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 of alternatives, but we may have ideas that can contribute to that. And, and I, I think that that's what we wanna do. I don't think we're trying to go off in our own direction. Now, we may have started looking at something that the other committee hasn't looked at, um, or we may um, have some ideas that kind of resonate with what, what you guys are doing. I'm looking for a way to, uh, in this meeting structure to get some of that passed back and forth. And I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with that. I, I, I understand the confusion, Javier, and I, I, I want to just, um, I, you know, there is an overlap. It's not, it's, it, what we're doing isn't completely distinct from each other, um, but we're trying to look at the current activities of the police. Um, but that, kind of naturally brings up, uh, geez, does it have to be this way? Uh, and so that I ideas are coming up in our committee in that area. I, I'm not sure of the best way to, to inter, interface the two committees. Um, so just looking, um, Nandi, I'm not sure if you were still responding. Yeah, sorry, um, I should, should put, put my hand down, but let me just, add just a little bit more just to say that I, my own view and what I've heard from what Booker was asking our committee to do was is that we should prioritize existing policies and practices and services whenever possible because that's the work that's not being done by anybody else and it's work that people have voiced some disdain for. I mean there's been some I mean this is not a popular uh, investment for, for, for the for the uh, commission as a whole so it seems like our subcommittee has a priority like if you know, if we have limited time, we should mostly focus on that. But it does seem to be that we find ourselves, you know, just for example, when we talk, when we talk about the school resource officer and we, we got to the place like, oh, you know, it seems like the school resource officers are not really um, doing anything else other than providing sort of mental health counseling. Then it, the next thought was, well, maybe we should replace them with a, with a mental health counseling service. So it's, it's kind of, it seems like somehow we get to the place where we critique the existing services. And then somehow the natural thing is to start to talk about alternatives, but, but I, I do think we should try to keep ourselves somewhat disciplined that our main mission is to focus on the policies and services. Um, 
So that's what I'll say and I'll stop talking. Thank you. Okay, um, Javier and then Alex. And I do want to note we are at 8.54. We are rec rapidly approaching that 9 p.m. Um, end time uh, as well. Um, so Javier and then Alex. Yeah, I mean, my use of the word confuse is to just to point out to the fact that I ask in past meetings if you guys were moving to alternative policing and I was told no. So that my confusion ends there. Um, and, and the reality what you guys are doing is seeing how the police department is doing something, seeing the policy that they are using. And because you keep talking, you immediately default into what's alternative. That's not the problem. For me, the, it, for me, the issue is that if that happens, it's something that needs to be brought to the commission. So in that way, we can have a, 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 a process conversation about how we address that. Because I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you, no, you're wrong. That that's you shouldn't go there. Doesn't make any sense because the conversation goes in that direction, right? So for me, it's it's not the problem stepping in anybody's toes. For me, the problem is that when that issue arises, because it's really concrete, it's something that should go back to the commission. So in that way, we can coordinate. Because we can even have like joint subcommittee meetings if that's the case in some point. But if we don't talk about it, we cannot, you know, we cannot come out with any of those or dividing the, 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 the workload as Booker was trying to do. But the reality, we need to do it as a, as a subcommittees, not as a one-to-one -one person in a general meeting. Okay. Um, Alex, you yeah, I, I also wanted to note the time um, and specifically in terms of uh, how we're creating this uh, preliminary report. At this point, you know, we have we have three, we have our subcommittees are plan, planning on meeting again. Um, and ours will take what we've heard today uh, and try to, to formulate something, but then we'll have one more meeting um, and at that during that meeting, we have to come up with our fi final decision. Um, so, uh, I, I, I guess we'll do as best as we can, um, and and it may be that we we don't exactly have consensus on that, but that we'll um, we'll we'll say here's 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 where we're at. That that sounds good to me. Um, I'm looking at the, um, at the agenda that we have is still a couple of items and we haven't heard from the spending and contracts. Um, are folks okay going a few minutes over just to hear from that subcommittee before we think about adjourning and is there anything else that we want to add or say, um, about the policies and services before we move on? All right. Um, does anyone from the spending and contracts um, subcommittee want to give a very brief overview? Okay. Um, I guess I'll do a really quick, uh, quick one then. Um, since I'm on that that committee, um, we just elected um, Josie as the new chair of that subcommittee. Um, we are a little bit in a holding pattern. Um, we've made a bunch of data requests and we've got some of that information back from the city about sort of how the city allocates its funds um, and you know what the police are paid. Um, still sort of aggregating that, that over time, um, but we've looked at sort of comparing how the police have been funded um, in comparison to other groups. So like what percent their budgets have increased over time um, and seeing that the police department's budget has increased about 40% over the past 10 years, um, which is a pretty sizable amount. Other budgets still have, they've also increased in you know, other, other aspects. Some have even seen negative um, like the Forbes library, but that might be related to specific events um, and construction rather than general funding. Um, so we're looking to clarify that a little bit. 
Um, we did um, start looking at the police response um, for their time and how they account for their time in um, so looking at calls that come in, but also how the police report how much time they spent on those calls. Um, at the, the current report for 2019, so the last like fully closed year, looks like the police accounted for about 3,100 hours um, in you know call work, um, which leaves about 120,000 hours of 60 people at 40 hours a week. Um, for full-time employment. So we're still looking and we've asked her for some clarification about what else people do so that we can sort of get an understanding both of what the footprint is of the police, but also what the cost is associated with that, right? So how many, how much money is the city spending on these different activities? Um, and so that's where we're headed right now. It's still, um, we're still working on that and working on what other, uh, you know, what funding might look like based on some of the um, some of the proposals that that we've heard, um, at least to get an idea to start that legwork as well. Uh, and then I'm going to open it up, Alex, and then Lois. Uh, no, my hand was just up from before. Oops, sorry. Um, then Lois. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what, what we've gotten is uh, the response to call and. The Next thing that we're asking for is what their uh, police activities are that aren't responses to calls and how much time that takes. For example, um, a private property tax, which is a huge chunk of what they say they do in, in pie charts that they put out um, or um, uh, so, uh, self-initiated uh, suspicious activities or um, um, I'm, I'm here with Booker about being late at night, <laughs> um, many hours. Uh, anyway, so what, what we've gotten is, is just this list of their responses to calls and uh, it's possible that some of those calls, oh, the other thing is um, just police activities, like uh, where police cars are stationed around the city, um, waiting for, waiting to be called, and how much time that is. So these are like, I mean, we're, I think these are like the biggest chunks of what they do. Um, but we don't know specifically what those are. That wasn't the information that um, we received. We just received this responses to call. And so um, it's hard for us to really say, you know, this is how much money their time, each of these categories is, is, is taking up since we don't have these big pieces of category accounted for at this point. Right. Um, are there any other comments, questions on that? Okay. Um, so I think at this point, um, we'll say we'll move on. Um, we have the discussion of um, anonymity during comments and submitting public statements. And I think that is something that the new uh, subcommittee for community outreach can take up. So I think we should table that <laughs> um, sort of indefinitely, at least until we've got a report back from, from that group um, and how they're thinking and directing it. So then we can have a larger discussion, but it'll be more structured. Um, and then we have new business. Um, not sure that, do we have any announcements for new business? All right, um, then at this point, I am going to move to adjourn. Anybody want to second that?
Second. 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 Awesome. <clears throat> you or, sorry, any discussion on that? <laughs> awesome. Noah, can you give us a roll call? Yes. Uh, Lois. Yeah. Elizabeth. Yes. Booker. I think Booker stepped out. Oh, oh. Um, Dan. Yes. Nick. Yes. David. Yes. Alex. Yes. Javier. Yes. Namdi. Uh, yes. Michael. Yes. Josie. Yes. Cynthia. Yes. And Carol. Yes. Awesome. Motion to adjourn is approved. Mm -hmm. Great. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Have a good night. <laughs>